Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate, and we are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. What's going on, guys? We are back, and today's sponsor is MerrickHealth.com. They are a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. You've heard me talk about them throughout the last dozen episodes. They stepped up to help bring Table Talk back, and I want to thank them for doing so. The one thing I haven't been really clear on is the services that they offer and how they're offered. So we all know about getting lab work done. You've heard it talked about on several of the episodes we have and the benefit of having the lab and having them done. You also know the pain in the ass it is if you try to go to a health provider to tell them that your libido's down or you want to recover better from training or you think that you know, the, the shit that you're taking is damaging you or you don't have any energy and you're not able to recover. As soon as you start to engage in that conversation, they're either stereotyping you for being a meathead or just telling you it's part of the aging process and not helping you at all. That's where Merrick Health can come in. Merrick Health has a self-service option to where if you go to MerrickHealth.com backslash table talk, you can see on the designated Table Talk webpage, which I just created, which is really cool. If you click on the Get Started Now tab, you're gonna see the Table Talk panel that we have developed for you guys, which will test for total and free testosterone, progesterone, prolactin, I'm not gonna read down through everything, lipid panel, fasting and insulin, vitamin D, ferritin, cortisol, everything that you would need to have tested to know where you're health is, if it's optimal, if it's off, if it's not off, if you get the report with this, they're going to explain to you why it's off, why or why it's too low, why it's too high, how to be able to optimize it to be able to make it better. You can do all that right through the Merrick Health website, Table Talk discount code will save you 10% on the first order. If you want to have them help you with the process, and be part of their guided optimization program. They will set you up with a patient care coordinator who will review the blood panel with you, and there is urinalysis as well. Look at your markers, look at the indicators, and suggest over-the-counter options or prescription options that they can help you with to be able to optimize the recovery, libido, whatever that you're looking at. So guys, head over to MerrickHealth.com backslash table talk. Second sponsor of the day, obviously, is EliteFTS.com. We dropped two new limited edition t-shirts, one which I'm wearing right now, yesterday. Keep in mind that all of our limited edition apparel directly supports the Table Talk podcast. So head over to EliteFTS.com backslash Table Talk, right? Jacob? Forward, whatever, forward slash tape. Just go to elitefts.com. You'll find it there. The link is in the description. Limited edition apparel, 10% off your first order. And normally with the limited edition items, they only last about a couple weeks. So they are actually limited edition. Today, my episode is Luke Edwards. Now that I'm done with all the administrative stuff, I want to thank you for coming out. Thank you for having um, me. You were one of our most requested guests when I reached out after before starting season three, mm-hmm. said, who should we have out? You know, you were one of the names that kept popping up. I'm like, well, that's freaking easy. I can, <laughs> I can do that, it's sure. simple. Uh, what I wanted to do real quick though, is to give people a real fast rundown, mm-hmm. you know, of who you are and what your history is. Please correct me if I'm wrong on mm-hmm. any of this. You've been powerlifting for close to 16. I'm gonna add a few years to that because you did it before. That's how long you were at Westside. It was about 16 years. Yeah, 15, 16. You know, so about 20 years in the sport of powerlifting has totaled his pro total, which we just 
clarified in five different weight classes and actually did it in a reverse way. Most people will pick up their pro totals or elite totals as they gain weight. For instance, I had a uh, elite total in 198, 220, 240, pretty much in that order. Mm -hmm. You did the other way, you know, so <laughs> 198 was the last pro total that you picked up and that was towards the one of your last meets mm -hmm. was just a couple of years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Throughout this process, you've had two kidney transplants mm -hmm. and are West Side certified, mm -hmm. which is important because a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about is going to be about West Side training mm -hmm. and how you were training before and so forth. <clears throat> so what I wanted to do is just take people along your journey. You okay. got a lot to offer and a big story okay. you know, behind that. Is there anything in there that I forgot? that you um, want people to know about. The only thing is I got two of those last pro totals after two kidney transplants, and they pretty much, a lot of people said they'd never see me. I'd never lift again. So mm -hmm. that's kind of a big fuck you to their face, you know? No, that's, yes, <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> it, it is. So let's let's dial back. So how, how did you get started in, okay. first of all, how did you even get started in weight training? Yeah. So I had a grandfather who was pretty jacked. Uh, you know, he was 50, 60 years old. He'd always go to the YMCA, and he had muscle uh, mags, um, Flex Magazine or Muscle and Fitness or something like that. And so I would look at them. I'd look at the bodybuilders, and I was just mesmerized. I was like, I want to look like that. You know what I mean? And uh, I had, from that, he had, he was married, and he had a, a, a son-in-law that was a bodybuilder and a son-in-law that was a powerlifter. And the powerlifter was a, like a state champion in Florida. And before he'd get up, he would headbutt the bar and you'd like see blood coming down. I mean, this is eighties, you know, like oh, yeah. pure adrenaline <clears throat> and squat down ass to ankles and come up with like, you know, 800 pounds. I just thought that was like so cool. Mm -hmm. So I was into weight training and bodybuilding kind of at the same time. Um, when I was 12 years old, the YMCA had these little um, like wristbands and you couldn't get into your like 16 or older. And so I got one somehow, like, out of the trash or whatever, and I put it on my shoe, and I'd sneak into the weight room, like, five days a week, three hours at a time, yeah, yeah, just yeah. pumping for, you know, <laughs> four or five years. Um, it helped me uh, in sports, uh, football, and wrestling, you know, in high school. And then um, I did a meet during wrestling season um, and deadlifted uh, 400 uh, conventional with just a belt at uh, 14 years old. Um, so, you know, I, I, I knew I was strong, you know, from the beginning, you mm -hmm. know. I, um, and so then I did some bodybuilding shows as a teen and kind of got, I, I, you know, everybody's got screwed, but like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it was apparent, like, you know, if you're sucking off the judges, you're going to, um, place well. And, mm -hmm. and like, I'm, I'm not a sellout. I never will be. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was helping a buddy and he ended up not win any overall and that was when i was just like fuck this man i'm going to powerlifting uh I, people have been talking to me i was doing um i could incline press 455 for three sets of six to eight um any given day of the week uh and then i i benched 550 touch and go like it was nothing and had i known like 600 was like something then uh i would you know i went for it. i was 300 some pounds i mean i was huge mm -hmm. um and so like in powerlifting it's like it's kind of like wrestling you know there's some uh politics or whatever but you know you either get the weight or you don't you know what i mean mm -hmm. like um and so then i got into powerlifting I, I got all the west side videos watch you and chuck and all them and i was just like what the f i wanted to look like john stafford and mike rosario at the same time you know yeah yeah without, yeah, solid, yeah, yeah you yeah. know um <clears throat> and so i spent a whole year of training and then i finally did a meet and uh i totaled uh 2000 at 242 my first uh meet and then uh i went how to, old were you at the time uh i was probably 23 or 24 mm -hmm. um and because i for whatever reason i thought i wanted to look pretty and powerless because you know i wanted to be mm -hmm. you know like super just so i got like super ripped i cut down 220s 216 end up bombing out from 320 and then i did my first meet at 242 and that mm -hmm. was like my home for a while and uh i and then i about a year later, I got my pro total, um, total 2226. And that's when I got invited, I was able to do the pro am, the first power station pro am. And from there, uh, I was, I had already been to Westside a few times as a guest with, uh, my uh, old training partner, Gabe Daniels. And, uh, he had been there a few times back way in the past, but anyways, uh, I was living in Indiana at the time and Lou talked to me and, and invited me to be there. Um, 
And so about six months later, I saved up money, didn't have a job lined up, nothing, and just moved to Westside, and, uh, you know, the rest is history. Yeah, you know? I remember Gabe coming out. Yeah. Because you know, he yeah. wasn't super regular, but it was regular enough that I remember the name. Yeah. His grip was just insane. Yeah. I, he, uh, I don't know how many people could close the number four gripper, grips of strength now, but back in the day, it was only like 25 people, and he, he was one of them that could shut. Yeah. yeah. So you trained with him for? Uh, about two years at, in his basement. We called it the dungeon, and that yeah. motherfucker, I mean, he goes hard. Yeah. Hard. Tell yeah. me about a time when he went hard. Um, so I mean that you can remember this like wow. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, oh, I know, I know one. <laughs> yeah, we were outside doing uh, farmers walks, and I remember it was right after a meet. And you know, okay, you kind of like eat like shit after a meet, you know, because yeah. you're like celebrating and whatever. And so it was like the day after, the two days after, because Gabe didn't give a fuck. Gabe's training every, you know, if it's mm -hmm. a train day, it's train day. And uh, so I did these farmer walks, and it was probably the fifth or sixth set, and it was down and back, you, had to, you know, how thirty yards down, thirty yards back, mm -hmm. whatever it was. And I remember dropping the weights and laying down and thinking, God, please take me now. It was, I, it was, I was, it was one of the few times I was ever like, fuck, man, you know? And that's why when I got to Westside, I wanted to train with Chuck. And everybody was like, oh, you know, Chuck, don't, he'll put you in the hospital, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, this motherfucker ain't gonna put me in the hospital. It ain't nothing worse than what Gabe was doing. And it yeah. wasn't, you know, because yeah. Gabe, is, you know, it's, it, Chuck's an animal. Gabe was another one. Like, yeah. It was just, because he had did strongman training too. And that's, I mean, that's, you know, a whole effort type of strong, yeah, you know? Yeah. What happened after you're laying on the ground? Well, I, mean, I, just... I got up and did another set once <laughs> I caught my breath. But, like, I remember just thinking, God, take me. I, I'll never forget that day. You know, like, mm -hmm. it was so – and we would do stones, and we never put nothing on forearms. And so it was like – uh, it would chop your forearms, you know, to pieces. I don't know if you've ever done something. Mm -hmm. They cut you like, you know, like nobody's business. And because he had, he built the stones himself. So they weren't like completely round. So they were kind of like, yeah. you know, choppy. And yeah, man. Yeah. He got, he got me strong. That's for sure. He built my grip. Yeah. So then that kind of leads you into West, West Side, right? Yeah. So, and that was after the first one of the nationals, right? Is that what you... After the pro-am. After yeah. the pro-am. Yeah, after the about pro -am. six months, yeah. What, what caused you to want to make that move? Oh, it's just that it was the dream, living the go to Westside. I remember reading in the magazines when I was younger and stuff. Just I wanted to train with you, and uh, uh, you were gone. But, like, mm -hmm. John Stafford, he was gone, mm -hmm. you know, but Chuck was still there. So I lasted on a Chuck for mm -hmm. probably about the first 10 weeks, and then we did that one meet, and... Um, uh, or it was six weeks because I got my name on the board um, and took Chuck off. I had been there like 12 years. Um, and then he left, you know, he went to Lexington. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Why though? I mean, it's given all the other places that you could have went. Yeah. You know, I, I, I try to figure out that, you know, the, the people that have migrated to Westside, you know, there's, there's the culture aspect, but you yeah. really don't even know what that is because yeah. you just visit kind of here and there. Yeah. So it's, um, it's, I mean, it was the Mecca, you know, the mm -hmm. powerlifting to me, that was like, I was surprised how small it was when I first got there, mm -hmm. you know, because, uh, you see in the videos, like it's larger than life. You know, when you're watching, like, you think that's that monolith, that famous monolith mm -hmm. is fucking, you know, they just huge. Mm -hmm. And it's a, you know, it's a small, it's kind of a dump, you know, really. Yeah, when you got there, was it still just the one side? It was two sides. Oh, so it was just, two sides. Uh, yeah. yeah, he just opened it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It's just, when I was there for like the first few years, it was like I was living a dream. Like I, I had no problems getting up in the morning. You know, I was, it was like I, uh, the highest drug I'd ever felt, you know, like, cause I was just with the crew, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so the first six weeks I was there, I got my name on the board, you know, which kind of pissed some people off. Cause mm -hmm. you know, like they'd been there for a long time. And then I think like Greg Penor or somebody had a voodoo doll on me because like a week later I smashed my car and a dude who had a screwdriver and, uh, he had no license, smashes me, and uh, I totaled my car. Well, then 10 days later, I'm standing on the highway putting gas in my ex-wife's car, and some car is going 50 miles an hour, uh, and there was an icy roads, and he would slam on his brakes fishtailing. The highway's huge. I don't know, mm -hmm. but he hits me, and uh, I'm pinned between her car and uh, the car that smashed me. And I remember it just kind of screaming across, but I blacked out for most of it. Um, all I got out of that was a torn knee, but – Next week was the Arnold, so I'm like, I'm still training. My fucking legs are black, and everybody, like, you know, used to come out from mm -hmm, er mm -hmm. all everywhere, and they were just like, what the fuck? They couldn't believe I was still squatting, you know? Like, mm -hmm. I, I was so scared to call Louie the next day because it was a Thursday night and because it was squat day. Mm -hmm. I was so – because I had just moved there. I was like, man, I can't fucking – but I couldn't walk, you know? Yeah. Like, I was fu fucked up. I ended up tearing my oblique out of that, and so – 
I do a meet with a torn oblique. I just use duct tape to, to keep, mm-hmm. keep it together. I end up squat. I, I got my first 2,400 total. And I remember I pulled, I pulled 750, fell with it, no lift. 800, barely get off the ground like this much. And I reach here, my fucking oblique. And I'm like, holy fuck, I'm done. I'm done. And then uh, my ex says, you know what? We'll go to the hospital if we have to, but you're going to pull this fucking weight. And somehow, by the grace of God, I don't know how I pulled 800 and total 2400 you know it was my first 2400 and i just i think it was my will you know Mm -hmm. my will did that that was was you that was your first meet no Uh, my first meet was um i pulled uh 810 i totaled 2360 or something like that at at the pro-am um but this meet was like three months after you know yeah meets about every three months yeah so after that after the point of the 800 right with Mm -hmm. Torn oblique. Third attempt after missing the first <laughs> right, two. Right. You know, for the listeners that have no idea, you know, what what did that feel like at the time? When I pulled the eight hundred. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it, it's just it was amazing. I mean, it, you know, it, it, you can't explain uh, what it's like when when you, you know you're kind of down and then you fucking just pull. It's just a it's a surreal feeling, like out of body experience, you know, like, like almost like heaven in, in a way, you know, it's just, it's the most amazing feeling in the world. Like, uh, it, better than any drug or anything out there. You know what I mean? It's just, mm-hmm. a, it's a fucking high. Like when you hit a PR or it, it wasn't a PR there, but when you hit like a PR total, mm-hmm. uh, you, you know, it, like, like for example, Louie, if he had hit, hit, hit a PR of the day in the gym, he's the happiest motherfucker I've ever seen. He, he wants to buy you stuff. He gives you free stuff. You know what I mean? If you want, if you want anything, that's the day you would ask for it because mm-hmm. Louie, you know, and, and that's how you feel, man. You yeah. just want to be with your friends, almost like you're drunk, you know, like you, you start paying for drinks and stuff or whatever, you know, you buy everybody's food. You're just happy. You know, it's just a, it's a great feeling, mm-hmm. but the opposite when that goes away, that's a bad feeling, you know? Uh, well, when that goes away, I mean, how long does that take for that to go away? Uh, well, you know, it was always a great feeling up until powerlifting was gone for me. You know, yeah. um, I went through about a three year funk, um, with being on dialysis and with my mental, uh, issues, I found out I diagnosed I was bipolar. Um, I have to take four medications for that, you know? And, uh, with that, um, I'm pretty sure I'm di- dyslexic. I got to take a test for it, you know, but all that stuff makes sense. You know, like when I was young, there was a birthday party two we- two blocks away from my house and I fucking walk for four hours, can't find it. It's literally like two blocks. I come to my mom and that's a form of dyslexia, you know, and mm-hmm. she's laughing at me like, well, you know, it's just right up the street. And she had to drive me because I couldn't fucking find the thing. Mm-hmm. You know? But, you know, I, that's one thing I think with my mental condition, I was able to I, uh, not need medication because I could program on one thing, and that was being the strongest motherfucker I could be. You mm-hmm. know, every every day I went in there, you know, I was going to hit something big. You know. So when you program on that one thing, I mean, take me down that path a little bit. So let's go back to that meet, right? Mm-hmm. So after that meet, the mm-hmm. meet's over, mm-hmm. right? And then you know, being at Westside, I know how that works. That the meet's over, and then you got to find whatever the next one right, is. Right. Right. So in your brain, how are you processing that? Uh, you know, I, <laughs> so I go in the gym that following week and, and, uh, I had the tears like down my pelvis and, and, uh, um, my, uh, oblique and Louie had saline and he's like, lay on this desk. And I look out of the corner of my eye and this motherfucker's like this, you know, jabbing it in. And I mean, I, I went, I, he did it, you know, he put it in there, but I mean, he's like three inches from my dick. You know, I'm thinking, holy fuck. Good thing he had good aim, man. Jeez. Now, you know, what's <laughs> cracking me up is. You, <laughs> you held it like like that. Yeah, and I know exactly. <laughs> You've seen that. Yeah, oh, I see yeah. it coming yeah. in my yeah. pack. Man. Yeah, boom, boom, yeah. boom. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking bam. He, he has no. <laughs> there, yeah. There's no you know pinching the skin, whatever. He's no, jamming. no, he's just a fucking boom. boom yeah, boom. like he's fucking stabbing yeah. you. Yeah. How many times did he hit it? Uh, quite a bit. Um, yeah, he did it probably uh, fourteen times throughout. You know the next. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, two weeks or whatever mm-hmm. do you think it helped oh yeah yeah mm-hmm. saline i noticed and this people are gonna think i'm crazy but when i tore my shoulder this helped me and tommy will vouch for this because he's the one that did it i took about 15 shots straight you know in back of my shoulder in this with saline and peroxide and peroxide burns burns but it it like you know you see it foam up it does that to like scar tissue or whatever and breaks shit up like that's legit stuff if you can handle it mm-hmm. you know? you're sore for about two weeks after but mm-hmm. <laughs> you know I was able to train that day mm-hmm. so. with the with the oblique after that meet how long did it take before 
it started to feel there's some injuries that just take yeah. fucking forever and yeah. oblique is kind of oh, one yeah it, it, i mean it, i couldn't even cough it hurts so yeah. bad you know like if i move you don't realize how much you use your abs until yeah. something like that goes i'd say it probably took like uh three months of duct tape mm -hmm. you know during training that's probably, probably yeah i was gonna say how did you hack it did you you know I just duct, duct tape, tape yeah duct two tape. belts uh no no belts just duct tape real bunch of duct tape and knee wraps if needed yeah um i remember i was duct taping my leg one time because i'd always pull my hamstrings you know mm -hmm. always pen pulling and one of the dudes from he played for the buffalo bills he, he walks in because we had some guys from there he walks in he says dude that's the most hardcore thing i've ever seen i'm like and like you play fo professional football that's the most hardcore thing like i wasn't mm -hmm. thinking nothing of it but mm -hmm. you know you look back on it like yeah that's probably a little nuts you know but you did whatever you do to train well, knee wraps know? duct tape saline that's yeah. kind of yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm laughing, right? Because people watching this are probably thinking, what the fuck? And yeah. this is just like normal shit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you you do just, what you got to do to try yeah. and be a champion. Well, some of the things that I've always kind of wondered was, and Dave kind of helped with some of it when he was out, mm -hmm. Hoff, is, you know, I was there for 14 years or whatever mm -hmm. it was. And then the, he moved to Larkham, right? Mm -hmm. Which is where it is now currently. Mm -hmm. And it was just half that place. And mm -hmm. I was there maybe two years and then I, I was out of there before he went into the other side, mm -hmm. right? And but I've always wondered, you know, what what things stayed from the generation, whatever you want to call it, that I was in, mm -hmm. you know, through the next two decades, mm -hmm. you know, that were there, because um, obviously Louis learned, you mm -hmm. know, as he went through. So he's constantly experimenting, mm -hmm. you know, and some things don't work out, you know, and mm -hmm. some people pay the price and are happily, happily do so, mm -hmm. happily do so. Right. And then some things, you know, do, mm -hmm. you know, and over a period of how many, 40 fucking years, 40, 50 years, however many years he's been helping people. Right. There's a lot of shit that didn't work, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of shit that did, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, I've always kind of wondered culturally, you know, what things stayed, mm -hmm. you know, and some of the things that you're talking about are some of the things I, that were there. Right. right. And then in how it, how it played out within the different groups, right? Because you got the AM and the, the PM, and there was, they're all, it's still all West Side, right? right, right. But it's different. Mm -hmm. At least when I was there, it was mm -hmm. different, mm -hmm. you know? And it flipped, you know, it kind of seemed like it flipped, you know, after a while to where, um, you know, Louis, you know, the PM was always, what, six hours behind the AM or whatever, like or that, some yeah. bullshit yeah. like yeah. that. And um, the, the PM started to get better and better and better mm -hmm. and better and better, mm -hmm. you know, and the AM was where I'm going to make an assumption here. Correct me if I'm wrong. Louis spent more time in the AM oh, yeah. than yeah. he did the PM. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's really more of the cultural part mm -hmm. that's interesting to me, mm -hmm. you know, is, is that because the mentality that you're presenting mm -hmm. is the mentality he thrived. Mm -hmm. On, oh yeah. You know, at least when I was there. Yeah. And it seems like was embracing it while you were there as yeah. well. Yeah. Was that is that a fair uh, assumption? Yeah. I mean, Louis, Louis was a motherfucker up until about the time he turned like seventy two or seventy three. Like before he really softened up. You know, like he was still tough. You know, through mm -hmm. the whole, you know, my my whole time, almost my whole time there. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, only just the past couple of years did he get a little softer and, and let some stuff slide and whatever. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if somebody slacked off or whatever he loved throwing people out still mm -hmm. you know he loved that and i remember when i first got there he he threw somebody out and he looks at me and goes and don't you fucking sandbag or slack or whatever or you'll be out too you know and he does that little laugh he does mm -hmm. but you know he's fucking you know like, oh yeah yeah he's yeah fucking, he means it mm -hmm. and i was like you ain't gotta worry about that you know like mm -hmm. uh, you're not, i'm not if you kick me out i'm showing up the next fucking day you know like, mm -hmm. that's just my mentality you know I, i've noticed in life you're either a wolf or a sheep you know you can look in somebody's eyes and, and know if they're going to go to that level of mm -hmm. if it's life or death and most people won't go to that level mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and some will mm -hmm. you know and those are the people i like to hang around you know? i think those are the people that he he right he yeah he he yeah wanted more up right you you have to be kind of an alpha male with thick skin going into west side because it's not physical mm -hmm. everybody there's strong everybody mm -hmm. it's the mental I mean, every contest were kind of easy because every day in there was a fucking contest, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, we were leaving bleeding, you know, barely walking, you know? Like, you could barely, you know, walk and do your job or whatever, or driving was hard. There's times my central nervous system was so fucked. Uh, I would get 
lost, you know, driving because it, your central nervous system could be used so much band tension. You, you know, oh, yeah. 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 And it's just your hands will go numb, you know, taking naps and stuff. But, you know, you just you love it, man, because, you know, you're you're at the top. You know, mm -hmm. you know that at any given day you could be close to breaking a world record. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, you just you just have to put it together to meet because those guys are going with you. You know, like any time a guy in our gym hit a world record, I felt like it was I kind of had part of that too mm -hmm. because I know that they wouldn't have got there had I not pushed them, mm -hmm. you know, so. Tell me about a time when you, so you, you're you visiting back and forth, right? Yeah, yeah. Then you finally plant, move, yeah. And stay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Tell me about a time after you did that to where it was like, fuck, I didn't expect this. Never. Okay. Never. I knew what I, I knew what I was getting into. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, I came with training with Gabe and yeah. Gabe already had me well prepared yeah. for anything. Yeah. You know, the only time that it, I would say was when I got sick and I had to come back, you know, and like lose all your strength for the first time, you know, it's happened about 25 times now, but yeah, yeah. You know, the first time was like, fuck. And I know that like my intensity is not as much, but the gym started kind of getting a little softer too. You know, mm -hmm. like I wasn't able to push the volume that I could when I was healthy and or as healthy as I was, you know, and, and strong. You know, when I first got here, I had stage two kidney failure, stage mm -hmm. two, stage three. Um, I always think if I would have had healthy kidneys, what could I have total? You know, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I think I would have been able to do three thousand. You know, mm -hmm. if I would have been one hundred percent healthy, like Dave mm -hmm. or Donnie or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, when did you start to feel the inf the negative effects of the, the kidneys? Disease. Um, when I went to, so they wanted me to do dialysis the first time and I refused it, uh, for a year before I had a transplant and I wasn't supposed to go to this pro-am, but I did. And my opener used to be like 980 on the mm -hmm. squat and it was 880 or 870 and it took me three times to get it. And I remember it in the back going, fuck man, like this fucking sucks. You know, it was hard to catch my breath. I was on like. 100 megs of Lasix, so I had to really watch, make sure I didn't cramp, mm -hmm. you know, and um, yeah, the lakes is where you're down to, you know, and mm -hmm. then you're just like, man, so then you just, but, you know, I was able to train as hard as I was, and, and I was able to come back, it, something just lit a fire in me, you know, it's mm -hmm. just, it took a little while, it took like six months, you know, after surgery and all that stuff, but then it just, the, the bulldog thing just came back, you know. What was going through your mind, though, if, say, at that meet, right? You're yeah. like, fuck, you know, it's not there, right? Retirement. Yeah. That's what I was thinking, yeah. yeah. How long did that last, that thought uh, or that uh, processing that? It probably lasted, well, I, I don't know because I was still training. You know, I was still going in and training. But I didn't it's want in your it, head, it, it, It's in my head. It's, yeah. It was back in my head. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't full circle yet, yeah. but it was yeah. something where I contemplated, you know. And then when I was on dialysis in 2014, um, I said I was going to retire because, like, I didn't see a kidney in sight and all that. And that was still before I totaled those two pro totals. Um, and so I did that meet that Dave put on, you know, and, and took best lifter uh, with dialysis in 220 weight class. And... Um, I was like, this is my last meet, you know, because I, I physically couldn't train like that anymore because I, I didn't miss a workout and I didn't miss a day of work, you know, and, and I took a lot of pride in that because nobody else could do that. You mm -hmm. know, I, nobody else could go. They would be like, how could you do that on dialysis? You know, I would get, get up at 530, do my dialysis, uh, have to bust my ass home, bust my ass to work, do work, you know, fall asleep at the wheel or whatever sometimes do my job as a corrections officer. And so I'd have my, I had a, a thing I'd come out of my neck and I would duct tape it down so the inmates couldn't see that because I didn't want them to see any weakness. You know, in my fistula I have, I always kept it covered up because I don't want them to think like, oh, you know, I'm going to get over him. You know, I had 2,600 inmates down in the, and I worked the rec building to, and, and they'd be down there and all of them, you know, I had no problems, you know, because mm -hmm. like I said, they see it in your eyes mm -hmm. What if you're willing to go there. And, and I got massive respect for that. Plus, they knew I lifted weights, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I, that you know, that goes a long way in, in prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got sidetracked. I know that. But, I mean, while you're, <laughs> while you're, you're training, you have this retirement in the back yeah. of your head, right? Yeah. So, it's, like, it's kind of back and forth, back yeah. and forth, back yeah. and forth. Yeah. Um, why? I mean, what, what was the... I just felt like I... I couldn't keep up with the, the newer guys coming in, you know, like um, that was when Louie was really recruiting heavy mm -hmm. from outer states. And I was like, man, I don't know if I can, you know, keep, keep the good shape and keep 
keep pushing people like I could. And, and if I can't do that, what the fuck am I good for? You know? Mm-hmm. I understand the position because I was, I was in the position, right, right? right? So I understand that in how you're processing it. And at some point you had to make a decision that this is no longer on the fence. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's back because mm-hmm. it's, Obviously, you were all in before this, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So then there's this time, right, where you're still, still going in, through yeah. the motions, right? So you're still all in, right? But I'm, I'm training as hard as I can. Yeah, you're still yeah. doing everything you have to do. Yeah. But that one little piece mm-hmm. is still kind of up in the air, like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I don't know. Did that go away? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, like, I think every morning you have a choice, you know? You, yeah. You, like, is this going to be a good day or a bad day? And I, I try to thrive on the, po- I still do this. I try to thrive on the positively, positivity of, of life. You know, it's another day you're above ground, you know, try to appreciate all the things. And I think people who have almost died understand that, you know, I've almost died a few times. I should be dead by now. It's been 12 years, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and when you face death like that, it's just, you know, it's, it's different. You just, you, you don't take stuff for granted like you do when you're healthy, you know? So what about the gym? I mean, because obviously the gym, right, mm-hmm. is huge for you. Right. I mean, wait, like bigger than big, right. right? What about that creates that in your head? To keep going? Yes. Because, it, it, look, I, we can sit here and say it's the relationships, right? But you were there for 16 years. They come and go. Yeah. yeah. Right? And there's I, three, four-year cycles. I and mean, some people are, you know, solid. They're, gonna, they're there the whole time. Mm-hmm. That's a rare group. Like yeah, it's a, it's, yeah, a, it's, a, it's yeah. a small fucking group yeah. that lasts longer than three or four years. Yeah. They spin through. So it's yeah. not that, yeah. right? What is it? Okay, so um, I knew that I wasn't going to break a world record at the time. You know, it was, I still thought I could get on the board. And I knew I could contribute by getting two more pro totals or try to, to get five pro totals total, you know, mm-hmm. and be like the fourth man to ever do that. And so um, that's what. It could just lit a spark in me to where I wasn't going to quit. What do you mean by contribute? Um, you know, like I couldn't give a world record myself. So I wanted to give Lou a five five pro total. You know, I mean, it, it may not be a big deal in his eyes, but like to me, it was something like a gift I could give to him for him giving me 15 years in the gym. Mm-hmm. You know? Why did you feel like you owed him that? Because a lot of people, I think, take Lou for granted, especially if they break world records. Lou tells you what you're going to get in the beginning. And he's one of the most giving men I've ever seen. You know, he passes homeless people and he'd, he'd give them a 20 bucks, you know, mm-hmm. um, people have hit him up for money and he's got people out of jail and never asked for a dime. You know, he's paid for breakfast. Uh, if you get up early enough and go to breakfast, you know, four days a week, he's going to buy your breakfast. You know, um, he pays for your meats. He, he, uh, he bought a lot of my, uh, powerlifting gear you know suits and stuff and and it's just i don't know i thought that you know because he wouldn't want money you know and he wouldn't want a gift you know you'd be be like that's fag Mm, yeah 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 uh so that's what i felt like i could give him you know because i couldn't give him that world that world record like i wanted to Mm -hmm. this was the next best thing that i could physically do you know Mm -hmm. and that was last last year right uh 2018 so 2018 Mm -hmm. how did you feel after doing that uh, it was a surreal feeling. Um, so Surre- Lou, what do you mean by surreal? It was kind of like, uh, because I knew it was, I knew it was coming to an end, you know? So it's like, it's like a bittersweet, you know, like it's good, but it's bad, you know, like there's good feelings and bad feelings, you know? Yes. Like, yes. Um, so yeah, it, I, I was happy though. You know, like I was like, you know, it was the first time I had a picture taken with Lou and, um, it's, it's kind of weird because Dave totaled like 3,014 or something like that, something retarded. Mm-hmm. And the first thing he was talking about is how well I did. And I was just like, you know, I was just, and it, it, it threw me off. And, but like, you know, he was proud of me, you know, and uh, that I had heart. To, and plus being in the AM crew, I think he respected the AM crew a little more than the PM crew. Nothing against the PM mm-hmm. crew, but it was just a respect issue. You know, he, he wanted his best guys in the AM crew. You know, he wanted uh, like Dave to be in the mm-hmm. AM crew and Dave never really, you know. Why do you it. think that was? Why didn't Dave? No, no. Why do you think that's how Louis thought? Because that's when he trained. Yeah. You know, that's when he did his main lifts. Um, when you go to battles with people, you 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 have a a deep. Um, it's love. You know, you you love that guy. You you want to see him. Um, you want to kick his ass in the gym, but you want to see him do well 
at, at meets and because he's representing a part of you. And so it's just, a, it's a, it's a love, you know, like, you know, like, uh, for example, I'll say Gray Panor, you know, I hate the motherfucker forever. Mm -hmm. I, all I ever wanted, that was my motivation. I wanted to beat the motherfucker all the time. Um, and I couldn't do it. You know, I, I'd put, I'd try to bury him, you know, I'd fuck I, cause I was like a machine trainer and, and I, I just couldn't bury him and it pissed me off. And he was always just a little bit stronger. And, uh, but you know, I, after 10 years, you know, thinking about it and stuff, it's like, man, I love that guy. You know, like, mm -hmm. I, you know, when he had the stroke, I remember crying and punching holes in my wall because I didn't want, you know, I didn't want nothing bad happen to him, you mm -hmm. know? And, and so it's, it's a love, you know, Lou ain't gonna say it that way, but you know, that's, it's what it is. It's a, it's an interesting mind space to be in. Cause it's, I share that as well. Mm -hmm. Right. To where, you know, I'm in that same crew, the same dynamic type mm -hmm. thing. And there are other people that were better than me. Right. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, it's, Fuck it! I just I worked harder. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you know, wait a fucking you know, and it, it's it's you know what I'm talking well, about. Like I, it's it's frustrating, yeah. right? I, yeah, I've, How, I've I've learned the uh, the guy who works the hardest doesn't always win. You know yeah. what I mean? Like because I I definitely was the, at that time I was the hardest working motherfucker in there, mm -hmm. and I could never I was probably left 300, 400 pounds on the on the platform. I didn't you know because I think I was just I was so driven to murder people uh, that. Uh, I was spent by the time meets come, you know, my CNS was all fucked up, mm -hmm. you know, and why do you think that was? I mean, why do you think that your mindset was that much higher than other people that were in there? I think it's just your heart, your will, what you're born with, you know, you just something in you. And maybe, you know, it has something to do with your childhood, you know, being bullied or something. And, and you know, you don't, that's not going to happen when you get older. You know? mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a reverse role. Like ain't no motherfucker going to bully me. If I'm, if anybody's going to bully, I'm going to do mm -hmm. it. You know what I mean? Were you though? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was, yeah. I was, I mean, I was, I was, you know, in my twenties, I was 300 some pounds, you know, I was a big, mo and I was mean, you know, like I was pissed off because of my childhood and, and, you know, I, I didn't know that then, but that's what it was, you know? And, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, so I lifted weights and I bounced and I like to beat people up. <laughs> so the, do you think the lifting weights helped you to cope with i guess it's a for lack of a better word you it, know that it bullying me, it, it may it evens the field it, it it keeps you like out of prison you know because you have some outlet and i i could gravitate toward you know because i couldn't uh like physically like out, out on the street just beat somebody's ass you know like um so it was like you could take that out in weights you know like uh, it ain't like football where you can hit somebody you know what i mean because that's mm -hmm. gone you can't do that anymore so it's lifting weights because you could get all your piss and vinegar out right there and it's almost like an emotional process. You know, you're fucking angry in the beginning. And then at, by the end, you're like, you're the happiest person because, you you know, weight's lifted off your shoulders, mm -hmm. you know? So it was, so you're, you're bullied when you're younger. I, same process. Yeah. Again, we're kind of talking the same yeah. thing, right? Yeah. And then at some point in time, you realize getting stronger mm -hmm. means people are going to bully you less, mm -hmm. right? I always will say that I became the person that everybody used to fuck with to the person nobody wanted to fuck with. Exactly. And I took a lot of pride in that. Yeah, Right. Exactly, so yeah. is that kind of the same thing yeah. that processed through your head? I would say, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I grew up, uh, it, we'll get personal here, and, and uh, I had sex abuse issues, uh, physical and emotional, or uh, uh, verbal, you know, uh, abuse issues. And I think all that was one big, you know, tornado. Like, uh, I seen my dad, I was two years old. I seen my dad beat my mom, you know, and that was, I always thought I was dreaming it cause I dream it all the time, but you know, kid dreams that that's not normal. That mm -hmm. was, a, that was a memory, you know, and I, until later on life, I figured that's what it was. And so like violence is in my life, you know, and you can't just be violent all the time. So you have to be violent you know, they have to do it in, in a way that's not going to put you in prison, you know? Mm -hmm. And the weights were the only way that I could be as violent as possible, kick the living shit out of myself because, you know, I somewhat, you know, you mm -hmm. enjoy pain somehow, you know, like, like, and, uh, and, and be calm afterwards, calm as I'm going to be, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still a little hyperactive, but, you know, as calm as, you know, like I can control myself. You know? So you're, so let's keep that in your head, right? Mm -hmm. So you're in your prime, right? Mm -hmm. And then the dialysis starts to come and you mm -hmm. have to have the transplant. Mm -hmm. How do you process that? I mean, if this is your way to be able to cope, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. to be able to deal with, because what else are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Right? So what was going, how do you, how did that, what was processing in your mind at that time? Like you, you may never be able to do. So the doctor's telling you, you're not going to be able to do this again. Okay. So after my first transplant, I remember it was before my first transplant. I remember sitting in the transplant office and this guy, uh, he was six months post-op and he couldn't even lift up like a 15 pound box. He was talking about it. 
And I'm thinking, fuck, man, am I ever going to be able to do anything? So six months for me, post-transplant, I did a meet and I pulled 700. And that was like a big fuck you to everybody, you know, that all the nurses that told me I wouldn't and the people who believe that they can't do that. And I wanted to show that you can do this. You can do this if you put your heart to it. You know what I mean? Um, deadlift was the hardest for me, which really sucked because that was my favorite lift because they opened me up in, in your stomach, you know, and you know how you bend over. Mm -hmm. My conventional deadlift has been gone since then, the, since the first transplant, but I could still pull a little bit of sumo. And that was very rewarding. Um, I got off topic. What, what was the well, I, the, the question was more around, you know, that now you have this this coping mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. This passion, yeah, love, whatever yeah. we want to call it, the yeah. training. And you're being told you shouldn't do it again, yeah. right? Yeah. Part of you has got to be thinking, fuck you, I'm going to do this. Yeah. But then another part of you has got to be thinking, oh, shit, what the fuck am I going to do if I can't do this? So I was thinking in my head I'd rather be dead if I can't do this. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking of ways that to end it. And um, that's not a great way to think. So I just turned around and said, fuck it, I'm going to do this. You know, I'm coming back. You know, after, uh, it may take some time. You know, I'm not in a race, even though I did rush back. But I'm, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I, they said I could lift 10 pounds, right? But they didn't say how many times. So I go to a local YMCA and I put 10 pounds on everything I could do. And I do 50 reps, you know, people are probably like, what the fuck? This mm -hmm. guy's weak as fuck. But, you know, that I was happy I could do that, you know, because I, I just like, this is what I'm going to do. You know, like there's nothing else. I, you know, I'm not good at like crocheting, you know, like mm -hmm. lifting weights is what I want to do. Even if I'm going to be a, a different version of myself from the past, I'm still going to be happy as happy as I'm going to be because I'm, I'm able to lift weights, mm -hmm. you know, was, was the procedure done here in Columbus? Mm -hmm. Why the YMCA instead of West Side? I was embarrassed to go to Westside. Why? Because it was 10 pounds I was lifting. Um, I did go to Westside a little bit and visit, and then I'd go to the YMCA right by um, on, on Valley mm -hmm. View or whatever. And I, I don't know why I did that, but it was just, I don't know. I I, I didn't want, I don't know. I, I guess I was embarrassed, you know, like I, I didn't want people to see me, my main guys see me weak. You know, mm -hmm. I never wanted to show weakness. Yeah. I'd and really how, long, how long was that duration that you weren't there? Uh, I mean, I, it was on and off for three months. I would still go show up and help them, you know, but I, I just couldn't, um, after everybody left, sometimes I would, I would work out there too, but mm -hmm. it was never really like why they were there. Um, mm -hmm. a lot of times I'd go to Westside and just walk laps around the whole thing. Um, because you know, I was allowed to walk as much as possible. And that's what I think healed me because I was up walking all day long, you know, every day trying to heal, you know, after my first transplant, you know, your stomach gets open. They say you can't walk or whatever. I walked like 20 yards. That was like a huge success for me. I have all these wires coming out and, and a catheter in and I made it 20 yards, you know, and cause I was just like, I was bound and determined, uh, Sakari who trained, um, bull farm. Mm -hmm. He told me, the stronger you go in, the stronger you'll come out. And that stuck with me. And I'm like, you know, I'm getting as strong as possible. I competed like a week before. Oh, for the transplant. surgery. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, bu I built myself up as strong as I was going to be. Um, I probably would have pulled close to 800, uh, you know, because mm -hmm. I was building it up, you know. And, and anyways, I bombed out in the meat. But I had my transplant the week after. And I remember, you know, that 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 stuck with me because it, it worked, you know. Mm -hmm. I was stronger than the four people who were transplanted that day. You know, I was the only one mm -hmm. that got up and walked. I was the only one that was walking every day, you know, from then on. You know? I believe there's a lot of truth to that. You know, it's I approached yeah. both of my hip replacements, every yeah. surgery I've ever had. Yeah. I've approached it like I'm peaking for me. Right. You know, so that way, because you're going to you're gonna get knocked out. Right. Right. I mean, it's, it's gonna the happen. dialysis is going to knock you down yeah. big time. Yeah. Um, how long was it until you felt like you could – train with some semblance of um i was back squat with those guys probably i think it was 10 weeks mm -hmm. post-op i think they're supposed supposed to be three months for someone normal yeah uh, i say normal that's not luke edwards you know? yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. so yeah about 10 weeks eight ten weeks i was back squatting with those guys um with a green band and and some weight and then it just progressively got heavier like the third week wave i was doing four plates plus a green band for sets you know and I was happy with that. You know. How was the recovery? Because obviously your work, well, actually your work capacity was probably okay because all the walking, right? Yeah. So the recovery was probably. Um, I put on a, uh, so it was like a, uh, almost like a Ray-Ban over, mm -hmm. over my belly, over the surgery, and then a belt, and that just kept it tight. And that seemed to help, you know, tremendously. And, and uh, yeah, I kept my work capacity up because, I, you know, I was walking a lot, and I was doing the things I could do and mm -hmm. as much as I could do it, you know.
And what were you doing with your body weight at the time? Because now we're about six, seven years into your powerlifting yeah. career, maybe a little bit more. So I was trying to be a little lighter, um, but that didn't work. I ended up, uh, my heaviest, I think I got like 267 um, before the, you know, I ended up failing again. Mm -hmm. And and then in about two days, they put me on prednisone and stuff like that. I went up to like 340. I've never been that big in my life. And it was all water. And mm -hmm. I remember like, you know how we, when you go, when you jog a mile, like each time gets easier. And for me, every time I would try, cause I was still trying to walk every time it was just like the first time. And I'd have to sleep on a chair uh, up cause so I could keep the water down. And I remember one time, uh, like my testicles were so swollen, they were sticking out and they're like, you can't go to work like this, you know? And, and my feet were footballs and my knees. And like, I'd have to pick my legs up to get in my car and I'd have tears in my eyes, but I still went to work. Uh, and then that's when dialysis finally kicked in. I was able to kick my weight down, you know, and get all the fluid off. But man, it was painful. Mm -hmm. It was painful. Yeah. How long was the dialysis that time? Uh, how long was I on it? Yeah. About two years. And how long was each duration that you treatment? Had? Yeah, the uh, treatment. It's like four, four and a half hours, um, three times a week if you go in clinic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it takes out. You don't like to be in a clinic either because you look around and those people are just will, waiting to die. You know, like there's nobody that's active. Um, there's, you know, I'm sure somewhere mm -hmm. there is, but mm -hmm. on my time frame, there wasn't. Like you take guys would take their socks off and their feet would be black or they're missing toes or they're missing a foot or whatever because um, diabetes is mm -hmm. big, you know, and you'd be people next to me be puking and coughing. It's just gross, man. And like, you're like, this is so negative. Like, I don't want to be, the, the nurses were great, but like, it was just like, geez, man, you know, I don't, this is too much, you know? And so Dallas is already is very negative because it, it puts you almost like in a, in a hell, you know, and um, it's hard. Uh, it's hard. It's been hard on my family the past couple of years. It's, it's, it's just a strain, you know, to constantly have to do that all the time. And, 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 but it, you do what you got to do, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so you were doing that and still training. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I had it set on my off day. So Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I would dialyze. And I would train Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. And still go to work. Um, I think my off days was like Wednesday, Thursday or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how did, how did that impact your training? Oh, I was tired. You know, I was so tired. Like, I remember just always being tired. Like, it was just like, oh, and sl just sleeping as much as I could. You know, Dallas is already, they say a dialysis treatment is like running a half a marathon or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, your body's just zapped sometimes. And I just, yeah, I was tired all the time, but I, I did it. You know, I, I don't know. I think it's just will. You know, you just, it's like, I have to do this. You know, if I still want to do this, I have to do it. So you, 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 you never missed a session, I assume, no, right? No, no. Did you think if you missed one, you'd be fucked? Because no. if you if you gave yourself an excuse to miss one, then you'd miss two. No, I don't. I don't. No, I didn't think like that. I just because sometimes doctor's appointments would come up, so I would probably miss. Yeah, it. yeah. So, but, I mean, that's you know, that, yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. do nothing about. Um, so no, uh, no, I don't. I don't. I just. I don't know. I just. It was something. It's just something in you. You know, there's just something. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. you stayed at Westside 14 years, probably longer than you ever wanted to, because it just you know. Or, or you just felt like you needed to, you mm -hmm. know, like it's a necessity. It's not a one anymore. Oh, it's I know, like I know. I'm, there, I've, been, you know? I've been spending my whole life after that trying yeah. to figure out, right? You know, because had my shoulder not been as what it is, yeah, fuck, I'd probably still be there, right? You know, it's right. It's, right. So that, you know, it's with distance, you look back and you try to have different perspective, right? And say, you know, I I can't tell you, I can't tell you why, you know. Was, right. I mean, here I'm trying to ask you fucking something that I can't even answer myself. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it, it's it's weird because someday somebody's gonna have an answer. Yeah. I don't fucking know what it is either. I you think know, it's, it's just, I think it's just a necessity. You know, it becomes a, a need. Like you need to be there. You know, because you know, like like for me, I think uh, my day is all fucked up if I don't if I didn't mm -hmm. get the workout in, you know, especially back then, if I didn't get the workout in my That ain't a workout you know. though. This is training. This training. is two different training. things. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I, I, yeah. If, yeah, yeah. if I missed a training session, yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew I'd be, you know, I just, it'd throw me, me in a funk, you know? And, and so I tried n never to miss, especially if I was competing, I wouldn't miss at all. Like, you know, you can't miss if you're competing, you know what I mean? Like in my mind, you know, mm -hmm. looking back on it, you probably could, and you'd probably be stronger because you got extra rest. Because like I don't think a lot of people, have, you know, you say it's not Westside till you train Westside, and you know this. 
it's a whole nother animal because somebody because eat a lot of big egos are in there mm -hmm. and before too long it comes a pissing contest you know and and it it's gonna it could a lot of times it goes to a fight you know but the thing is i would say is a big thing we were a family you know we, we may get in a fist fight but we were going to waffle house after training you know mm -hmm. and we were it was cool then you know but those two hours we were the you know all mm -hmm. of us were enemies i didn't talk to anybody until after training or like towards the end never Mm -hmm. never did i maybe what's up but or to give a head nod but it, no these guys were my enemies then you mm -hmm. know i wanted to fuck them up do you think that helped or hurt both i think you got to control your adrenaline and i think in there sometimes you, people get too hyped up and i think it carried over for me i'd get too hyped up like in meets and i think i'd miss sometimes because i got too fucking you know mm -hmm. shaky and like oh, yeah. ready to fucking explode and so, yeah, I think it does hurt, but I, in a way it helps too, because, you know, sometimes people just don't want to train, you know, like they're just like, hey, I don't feel good, but you, you, you know, you get some motherfucker in your face and whatever, you, it's go time, you know, like, you know, so it's good and bad, you know, mm -hmm. there, there's, you know, positive and negative to everything. I think. What were some of the, what were some of the traits of, how do I want to phrase this? There would be people that would come in and you could just know right away. This, this thing ain't gonna last, right? Right, right? I mean, so forget about those, yeah. right? Other ones that come in, maybe look good, you know, kind of do the right things yeah. for like a, a month. Yeah. And then you can tell yeah. this, this ain't yeah. gonna work out. Yeah. Um, what, were, what were some of the traits that you would notice that were common amongst the people that weren't gonna work out compared to the ones that you knew would? You could tell by their body type. You what know, do you mean? Just looking at them. You could tell if they're going to work hard or not. You know what I mean? If somebody comes in fat sloppy, yeah, he's probably out of shape. Mm -hmm. And in West Side, we're in good shape. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you go, I go, you go, I go mm -hmm. on squats and stuff. You know, there's no time between. So you mm -hmm. got to be in good shape. A lot of, that was the biggest thing. A lot of guys didn't realize the conditioning, you know, and, they, and strong guys, like 1,100-pound squatters, would get gassed after, like, the second set because they can't keep up. But, yeah, you could just look at a, a body type and be like, you know, he's not going to. He's not gonna make it, you know. And very, very seldom did anybody really make it through, you know. Mm -hmm. what I mean, and, and stay there for year after year of year after year, you know. Were there any that surprised you that you didn't think were gonna make it? AJ, mm -hmm. AJ did. When AJ first got there, he's kind of dumpy and and weak, and uh, I was like, I was gonna run all over him, and mm -hmm. I did for a while. But yeah, he got strong, mm -hmm. he got real strong. Um, AJ, you know, he's. He's about it, and I, he was tested a lot, and you know he 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 did everything he needed to do. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Any yeah. others you can think of? Uh, Tony Ramos always surprises me. You know, like he's only like 198 pounds, but he's a strong motherfucker, man. He just, you know, he comes in and out. We call him the ninja. You know, like he you know, he may you know, he might miss like you know two months of training to yeah. show up for two weeks and then be back gone again. He always surprised me. Mm -hmm. um, I can't really think about anybody because you know they even if they did make it for like a year or two they were gone you know like they they weren't they didn't last you know very long you know why um, do you think that was they just can't handle it mentally you can't handle is that what it is they couldn't handle lou i don't think mm -hmm. um lou plays chess not checkers mm -hmm. and he will fuck you up mentally if you have thin skin or if you let you know let him get in he's he's like a dog like a dog smells fear if he can get in and try to break you he's going to and then you're gonna start talking about you a little bit and he'll talk about you a little more that's the second time and then the third time he's kicking you out mm -hmm. yeah do you think that when i was there there weren't a lot of options yeah you know you had that you had west side and that was maybe world gym mm -hmm. maybe you mm -hmm. know there there were nowhere else to go mm -hmm. so you you kind of had to figure it out yeah right so there's either that or you just weren't powerlifting anymore. yeah do you think having more options hurt that yeah because then people are like fuck yeah. you i can just yeah. go i can go down to lexon or i can go to doghouse or wherever and yeah. i can still work out and i don't have to listen to all that mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so with with that you know the the interesting question becomes was it necessary right because it's you know lou wanted his breed right yeah. that is definitely his breed yeah. you know there's no there's no doubt about that yeah. it's like breeding a certain breed of pickles that's, that's, that's what he wanted yeah. um, but he also wanted the strongest fuckers around mm -hmm. and a lot of those didn't correlate mm -hmm. some uh, lot, most of the time they did you know i want to eat my own words here most of the times they did sometimes it didn't mm -hmm. 
right? And then, you know, they'd bolt and go someplace else. Mm -hmm. And I've often wondered because it was, it was a little different when I was there because Lou really didn't throw anybody out. They were voted out, mm -hmm. right? So it was kind of, it was, he did and he didn't, right? So it was more like, hey, so-and-so wants so-and-so out. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you guys think? Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, whatever, fuck, get rid mm -hmm. of it, it, whatever. So we'd vote on the whole thing. It, he, and we used to bust his balls about it. Like, you don't have the balls to do this yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, it's your fucking gym. Like, you fucking do it, you know, because he'd have Gritter do it or Chuck do it or, you know, somebody else would have to mm -hmm. do it, you know, and Gritter drive to somebody's house and tell him he ain't fucking coming back, you know, whatever it's going to be. And um, at a certain point in time, it, it change yeah. you know where louis was just yeah. doing it and i think his his patience started to wear more thin yeah you know too with yeah. the whole thing where it was not a common thing i mean if most of the time people just left mm -hmm. you know they, they didn't last they yeah. come for a few weeks and they're just gone and mm -hmm. you and i still don't know what those characteristics are like because you could tell i could tell like as soon as they walked in i could see in the fucking eyes you ain't gonna knowledge. fucking make it yeah. man you ain't gonna make it yeah. and you know it. it's just a matter of what the fuck you wasting our time for just you know mm -hmm. and we're saying this to the people too right, right. you know like you're the fuck you know just trying to expedite it because you're in the way yeah. you know it's, it's, <laughs> and um where it seems like later he just said you know kind of what you were saying mm -hmm. you, he'd get in your head i mean he's always in everybody's head but mm -hmm. he'd get in your head get in deeper and then get in deeper mm -hmm. then it's like look you've been giving your shot mm -hmm. fuck out mm -hmm. you know i don't know when that pivot, you know, happened, yeah, I kind of know. <laughs> probably, when you, probably you guys saying something to him, getting his fucking head uh, about, you know, not throwing him, anybody out. It probably got in his head and just, just yeah. freaking, but you know, because Lou, if something gets in his mind, man, he and and it's something that sticks. It, you know, he he's stubborn. He ain't, it ain't mm -hmm. you know coming out. Um, but yeah, I think his patience did get a little. Um, I, I seen him one time. He went outside to hit somebody because he thought it was somebody else or whatever. And like this black haze came over his eyes like a fuck, like a pit bull, man. I've never seen nothing like that, you know, just, and it, it was crazy. And and then he got to the guy's face and then he dropped it. And I mean, the guy's loose probably 64 at the time, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, still had the piss and vinegar. Oh yeah. I mean, there's, you know? it's, I, I, there were a couple towards <clears throat> my end period there that it was him. It was a hundred percent him. I mean, mm -hmm. we'd vote and the vote was in favor of keeping the person. The person was still out. Care, right. Yeah. So it was, it was definitely him. And a lot of the times, you know, I kind of wondered cause it's like, I, I didn't get why, you know, with some of them, I didn't really like, I knew the reason, right. I didn't know it cause it was, but there's a lot of better reasons to keep the person. Right. And then I would wonder sometimes that, is he just doing this so none of us take this for granted? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Where, I mean, because you never know. I mean, yeah. he could turn around and just say, you're fucking out. Yeah. It, it didn't matter. You, you might think that you're on good grounds, yeah. but I saw people on good grounds. Yeah. And they're fucking out the door. Yeah. And I wondered if that was, it, I'm sure it was, part of his mental manipulation to make sure that you're always busting your ass doing what you're supposed to do because you could be gone any day. Yeah, that, and I think, like, for a short time that I was there, like, the first three years or so, he wanted thoroughbreds. Like, he yes. got rid of all the weak guys, like, the guys that could handle us at meets. He got rid of all of them. It was just guys that could almost potentially break the world record that were going to bring it every day. He wanted guys that could do that and guys that could work hard. That's all he wanted, you know? And I think he got like that, and then he got a little softer with it and let some guys, you know, in. Um, but there was about a three or four-year span where it was just, you know, like racehorses. That's all he wanted. As a competitor, how did that work out for you? Because there's pros and cons to that. The only thing that sucked was, you know, the guy who was wrapping my knees before isn't wrapping my knees now, yeah. you know? That sucked. But, like, training would get super intense, you know? And it, it was a lot of fun, you know? I, I, love, I love that. You know, I, I, I wish that, you know, you could go back 15 years, 16 years, you know, and do it again because it mm -hmm. was that much fun, you know? And, and at the time, I didn't feel like it was that f much fun because, you know, it's like um, – it's a lot of work, you know, and your body's beat up and you don't want to go to work after because you feel like shit, you know, and, uh, but looking back on it, man, I'd done nothing else. You know, that was, that was a ride of my life. You know, that was awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Give me an example of some of the sessions that you're talking about. Usually it's a squat session. Oh right? uh, yeah. Squat session. A uh, lot of max effort days, uh, pulling, um, benching. There would be certain like bench only guys that would train with us. Um, 
it, it, you know, it'd get intense there, like real, you know, good ones yeah. that were in shape. They were still yeah. in good shape. And I, it just, you know, I don't have one per se because they were all pretty good. I mean, yeah. they were all good sessions. There's got to be some, though. I mean, think of, a, you know, a, a time when you're like a dynamic squat workout. Say there's two or three of you going back to back. And it just, so, after three or four sets, yeah, I know you know what I'm talking about. Something clicks. Yeah. And it's like, it's a different thing. Yeah. Um, well, I'll give you one example. It was it was super hot that day, and we were squatting, and we did our first. It was our first week wave with a, a, the old safety squat bar. Mm -hmm. Now, anybody that don't know, like mm -hmm. people who think they can safety squat like 700, come to ours and can't do mm -hmm. 500. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, we call it old best. It's a neck breaker. It'll make your your squat strong, your bench weak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, anyways, we had all the bands on it. And we were and plus three fifteen or four oh five and we were doing uh sets of three and then the next week we were gonna max on it. And I remember like uh like the fifth or sixth set, I put it here, put it racket, and I go to cause I was keeping myself to from passing out while well, I missed it, fucking passed out, completely fall down, and Greg gets over me like Oh man! So I come to get up, and then just Greg goes, you know, and then I come to, and, and the guy, other guy goes, and then I go again, you know. It's that's just the way it was, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have any of the <clears throat> the deadlift sessions to where usually it's like a, a holiday, mm -hmm. like a, and the the night crew would come into the AM crew, and Louis would set up this stupid betting contest. Uh, no, we really weren't betting too much at yeah. that time. Uh, a little later on, we did some bets, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, not at that time. I, he wasn't really doing that. I think because he knew he didn't I, like he had some fucking warriors in there. Like he didn't want us to end up killing each other, you know, because mm -hmm. we're already, you know, going as hard as we can. You don't need to throw money on the table. Like mm -hmm. there was no incentive. We didn't need it. You know, the intensity was there. Mm -hmm. I hated those motherfuckers, you know, like mm -hmm. I wanted I wanted to kill them, you know, like and, you know, you can't do it physically. So do it through training. You know, I wanted to do one more set than them. I wanted to do one more rep than them. I wanted to beat them in, in whatever we were doing. You know, it, mm -hmm. it didn't matter. Didn't matter what they weighed. There was no weight class there. It was, you show up and you come to train. You know, like, I, I mean, there is weight classes, but yeah, in yeah, that place, yeah, there's yeah. no weight classes. Yeah. The top man wins. You know, there's no coefficient in that bullshit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's you know, you either, you got the five pound, you know, beating by five pounds or you didn't, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, you nickel and dime stuff too towards the end, you know, just to try and beat them. You know, guy gets a weight, you put a two and a half on and, and try and, and, and get it and, and beat him, you know, and then he might, open it might uh pop something in him and he'll go another five pounds you know and just yeah the intensity is unmatched you know i i have yet to see that anywhere else like even even in west side you know towards the later part um the intensity wasn't there you know uh there were guys strong but it was more let's use our phone and this and that because there were so many workouts i wish we would have videoed but we didn't you know what i mean like uh, that back then that uh, you didn't do that you were soft if you videoed you know like it was you, it was all about training that's all we cared about mm -hmm. um but yeah the intensity i haven't seen matched that you know i've seen in west side you know what i mean yeah so, why do you think it declined it's just a different generation um i think guys like us are a dying breed i think like real men are a dying breed you know there's a lot of softer men out there nowadays um it's just the way it is like i just don't think there's that kill or be killed mentality. Like we were raised and, 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 you know, like for example, you know, in the eighties, there's, there were studs that were actors, you know, like Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, all that. And nowadays you got like guys from twilight or whatever, you know, like, so like lifting weights and training all that's kind of already look on the decline looking in, in the public eye, you know, it's just, I don't know. I just think it's the generation, you know, the, there's too many, uh, not enough maybe dads in their life, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. Did you feel like there's a tipping point, right? So, so you got 10 people. I mean, the, these, I, we should probably define, you know, these crews are not, so I don't think people understand the size of what we're talking about with these mm -hmm. crews. It's not like 20 fucking people right. there in the morning. Right. I mean, it's, it, what was be a normal size crew? Probably eight to 14. You know, right around eight oh, to four. In there, yeah, yes. but not, not, not broken up in, in groups. It'd be like groups of three. No, yeah, I get that. But yeah. total, total in there yeah. during that AM yeah. time, yeah. right? Eight, eight, to, to eight to 14. While you were there, did it ever drop down to like three and four? Yeah, 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 yeah. When uh, Greg left, it was yeah. just me, AJ, and Matt Smith showing up for a yeah. deadlift session, and we were like, "What the fuck?" You no, that's know? fucked up, man. Yeah, I, I was, I was. There was a bunch of times, a handful of times, is me, Chuck, Louis, mm -hmm. and it's like maybe one other one, mm -hmm. and it's like, the fuck, mm -hmm. like what? Because it. it 
creeps not, up on you. It's not the same. And it's, well, it is. I mean, it's you don't see it coming. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's not like it just slowly. It's just like one day you're like, the fuck? Yeah. You know, like, shit. Yeah. You know, Louie would be like, we need more lifters. You guys need to get more lifters. We're like, where? Like, wh mm -hmm. where the fuck are we going to get these? We don't do right. anything. <laughs> right. You know, this is all I do. I yeah. come here, I go to work, I come here, right. I go to work. Right. Like, what the, f how? Right. You know, and so you put a little ad in Powerlifting yeah. USA or some shit yeah, like that. I remember that. Yeah. You know, then other, you know, other people would make their way in. But it was, to me, it was, it's always been this interesting little secret, right? Because everybody's like, people are just lined up mm -hmm. to come in. Mm -hmm. Like, first off, no, they're not. And the only time that ever would be is if we already had fucking 14 people. Mm -hmm. Then we don't need them. Right, right. <laughs> you know, when we need them is when we don't right. fucking have any right. of them. And um, so and I don't know where I got off track with that. But with those crews, when, you know, it's with that size of the thing, it makes it, more aggressive, more intimate. Yeah. You know, it's it's, yeah. it's easier to get in each other's shit. Yeah. Because you know each other yeah. well. Yeah. Because it's yeah. it's not a random gym. Right. You know, you're there. It's a family. It, well, you're there. Yeah. You know, four days a week. Right. Sometimes more. Right. All the time. Right. No holidays. You know, no. Mm -mm. You, know, you don't. If anybody misses, it's a fucking rare, rare, rare occasion. Mm -hmm. You know, so that it's, it's a weird bond. Yeah, you don't you know. ever take vacations either. Like your vacations yeah. going to a meet. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you, you don't. There's no vacations. To answer your question, when I noticed the flip, yeah. For uh, so Chuck came back. Me, Chuck, and um, Jake Anderson were training together. Mm -hmm. Three guys that potentially could have pulled 900 in our career didn't. But anyways, when they went and trained with us. And they went and trained with someone who was, I don't know who they trained with, but it was softer. You know what I mean? And they didn't train with us who had been there for, you know, however many years and had the knowledge and, and whatever, especially on like max effort deadlift days. I knew this is just a different group because I would have killed somebody to train with those kind of guys. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I wanted guys that, that had brought it every day, you know, not guys like, oh, my fucking back hurts. I'm going to take it easy. No, man. I want a guy who's going to go 100%, you know, give it, put their heart into it, you know. They may not be the strongest guy, but they're going to fucking, they're going to go, you know. Mm -hmm. you know. What's some examples of things that you've seen with people that didn't have it, right? So it's, you know, I, I can think of, and I don't want to throw names out there, but I can think of certain people that you'd be training with, right? Mm -hmm. And then you'd see and you'd be like, the fuck? You know, and it, where to go back to what we were talking about earlier, in my brain, I'd be like, hey, just fucking wrap the thing up. Shut the fuck up. Mm -hmm. You tape, grab the duct tape and fucking mm -hmm. go. And I think I could tell if they did reverse hypers or not, like a lot of them, <laughs> not, you know, because those are man makers. And that, that's the truth. You know, you do 30 reps. That's going to that's going to condition you. Yeah. And if guys didn't do that or they didn't, they cut the rep short. That was that was one way I could notice. Yeah. They fucking suck. Yeah, they do. They suck. They when do. I, I got one sitting right there, <laughs> and when I left West Side, swear to God, I told myself I'm never doing another reverse hyper again yeah. the rest of my fucking life. I don't care how bad my back is. I'm never fucking doing it. And nobody understand. You might understand. Nobody understands where I'm coming from with mm -hmm. that. I'm like motherfucker. We're talking something I did 16 times sometimes mm -hmm. a week. Mm -hmm. You know, it was in my fucking garage every time you went in the gym do 20 reps on that month no i'm done it's like if i retired from anything it was reverse hyper <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I felt the same way and then uh, a couple years ago i blew my back out mm -hmm. and when i blew my back out what's going to fix it you know, mm -hmm. reverse hypers um man that was crazy i'd wake up in the middle of the night feel like someone saw my leg off mm -hmm. and i got a pretty good pain tolerance and mm -hmm. you know it was making me scream and shit and i was just like i gotta get back mm -hmm. to you know doing what Louie wanted you to do, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I was there, he was starting to, like about 2014, 15, he was pushing reps. So he wanted people to do like 50 reps and stuff mm -hmm. like that. God, Lee, that's a whole nother animal. About two minutes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we'd, have the, we'd have the yeah. time things. Yeah. Like do reverse hypers for five minutes. Yeah. And that didn't mean you kept moving. People yeah. misunderstand that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you keep moving it, yeah. but you're on the <laughs> motherfucker. You still can't yeah. do shit. You can't breathe either. Yeah, kidding, yeah, you know? just, yeah, just, and it doesn't matter if it tilts or not. It yeah. still yeah. sucks. It sucks, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With um, with your training and your 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 career path that you're moving through, mm -hmm. you know you get through the first um, kidney transplant, mm -hmm. recover from that. Mm -hmm. Were you? Did you ever feel like you were out of the woods from it? 
from lifting. The, the, no, 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 the kidney transplant. And yeah. The, the oh, yeah, yeah. All right, so you're out of the woods from that, and then bam, what happens to make it come back? Um, the uh, disease came back, and so it, it rejected. Uh, How did you know that? I started, uh, that's when uh, they put me on pregnazone because I started having a little bit of swelling. And like when I, when I was peeing, um, like it wasn't getting rid of all the toxins, my blood work, I had to get blood work once a month and yeah. that showed it too. Um, so they put me on medicine to try and bring it back. And that's when I blew up all that water, you mm -hmm. know, uh, like a hundred pounds or whatever, whatever it was, it was something ridiculous. Um, and so then that's when, uh, I needed to go on dialysis and I started dialysis and they had that poured in mm -hmm. and I was still, I was, I was when, uh, I was still going in the gym. I was still squatting, doing pull-ups and stuff with that thing in my neck and, um, you know, still going to work, whatever. And, and then I was able to start doing dialysis on my arm and that was two years still training. And then that's when I, you know, said, I'm going to retire, uh, you know, and then another kidney came, uh, 2015, I was able to, you know, have another kidney transplant and, um, I was able to, you know, uh, keep my weight down, um, because I didn't want to get too heavy for blood pressure issues and all that. And so that's when, um, I stayed 220 and then eventually went 198 and got that last pro total. And then, um, everything was going great. And March of 2019, after like three and a half years, I just, I lost the kidney. Um, they said urine retention. Um, I, my urine, I started holding urine and stuff. And, um, yeah, then I lost the kidney and, and I've been on dialysis now about three and a half years. Mm -hmm. So what's the path forward? Um, so I, I'm lucky enough. I can do home dialysis. I do everything myself. Um, I stick myself in the arm four times a week with, uh, two 14 gauge needles. That's about the size of your pinky. Um, and I can travel with it and all that. So I'm able to get more dialysis. It's almost like I'm a normal, per normal person with a kidney transplant. Um, not quite the energy of a normal person, but you know, mm -hmm. one step down. Um, I mean, I dialyze four times a week now, so that helps. It gets more dialysis, you know, more cleaning my body more often. Mm -hmm. um, and as of right now, I'm, you know, still hopeful for a, another kidney transplant. Um, but I don't like hang my hat on it. You know, like, you know, um, if it happens, it happens. You know, I've noticed, uh, especially these past couple of years, as I've gotten a little older and, and looked back on stuff, because I've done a lot of, uh, um, experiences with like journeying and stuff like that and, and taking a look at my life. And, um, it's just, uh, ah, fuck, I lost my thought there. <laughs> what do you mean experiences with journeying? Okay. So like you've heard of the ayahuasca experience. Mm -hmm. Um, it was kind of a form of that with, uh, mushrooms and ketamine and like, it just had, um, there was, it was a whole ceremony, like a, a, uh, like a shaman or whatever puts it on. And it just, uh, you see life in a different view, like, um, you know, like if you didn't believe in God before that, you're definitely gonna believe in God at that. I know what I was saying. Um, it's not, I've learned in my life, it's not your timing, it's God's timing, you know, mm -hmm. for, for everything. Um, when it, like, you know, people started freaking out about the COVID or something like that. I, I didn't really, that didn't bother me because it's like, when it's my time, it's my time. If God wants me to go tomorrow, you know, like I'm not scared of big crowds. I'm not scared of anything because I know that if it's my time, it's just my time, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. you can't be scared of death, you know, cause it's just a part of, of what we are. And, and I know I'm not trying to go get all weird or anything, but I do believe there's something after this, you know, mm -hmm. what I'm not a hundred percent sure, you know, but I do believe there is, you know, you know, something. So that, what else came from that journey? From um, that, experience? that I was able to, for the first time, forgive myself and you have to forgive yourself, I believe, to forgive others. Mm -hmm. And so I've had a hard time, like, forgiving my father, forgiving my mother, forgiving, you know, anybody that's fucked me, you know. And, and so... What do you mean forgive yourself? You just take a look at your life and you have to be uh, true to yourself. Like, admit what you've done wrong and just, you know, try to forgive what you did wrong. And once you can go through that process, then you can start to forgive others because you can just, you know, that they did, maybe they didn't mean it or maybe they were going through something or whatever, you mm -hmm. know, it was their journey, you know? And, and so I, I think you have to live with forgiveness in your heart and, and, and love in a way, you know? And um, like I used to never hug another man. And nowadays I'm just a big hugger. Like I hug everybody because like we see each other today, but that might be the last time we mm -hmm. ever see each other. You know, life is short. And, and the West side wall shows that because guys I train with, are on that wall now. It's so, it sucks, man. You know, like, but they were part of my journey or, or your journey mm -hmm. for a small time and then they're gone. You know, it's just, life's funny. It's, 
I'm not trying to get too deeper. No, no, it's, 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 it's interesting. It, no, it is interesting because there was one, one picture on the wall when I got there, mm -hmm. you know, Bill Peanuts West, mm -hmm. you know, then Matt Demmel. Right. You know, it's, I haven't seen the wall, you know, and I don't want to, yeah. you know, cause there's people on there. I don't, you know, I, right. you spend a lot of time, you know, with, you know, that it's, you know, I don't even want to ask how many people are, <laughs> you know, that are there. Yeah. Um, because I, I don't want to know, you know, that's kind of closing that off. Yeah. How many of those journeys, experiences have you had? Two. Two. Yeah. And what, from the from the first one, it seemed like it was a big awakening. Mm -hmm. What about the second? Second one was I thought I had dealt with all my pain from, like, uh, from my past. And the whole four hours I was curled up in a, in a fetal position crying. And, I mean, crying, crying, like... Um, I was wearing like eye goggles and they were just like, you could, you could ring them out. They were soaked. Um, and that helped me let go, you know, just like let go of all the pain and uh, recognize that it happened, but don't dwell on it anymore. You know, like it happened. Okay. So what, you know, it's not what's happening today. It's not how they feel today. You know, that's 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. whatever it is, you know? So you have to just forgive, you know, had you made these realizations before you, started your prime of your powerlifting career no do you think it would have been the same career no why i'd have been softer um i you have to yeah to lift weights you kind of have a, have to have an attitude mm -hmm. um, so to be successful to be a good lifter you know um it's not a, it's not like oh i'm i'm doing a bench international bench day on monday and then i miss the rest of the week no it's you know every day and four four days main you know um, even on the off days, we were still training, you know, we were always doing back or, or sled drags or whatever, something, you know? Um, yeah, I, I would have been, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have put all my all into it. I don't think like I did, you know, previously. Why do you think that? I, I just, like I said, you know, like, uh, growing up, you know, I, my first, uh, memories violence and so like I, you, somehow you have to be kind of violent uh, anybody who lifts weights at a professional level or like you know at the level we've been you're a little fucked up there's <laughs> <laughs> you have something in your childhood that keeps you coming because this is going to that gym is not fun every day you know there's days you don't want to train so why do you do it why the intensity because something in your mind you're fuck we're fucked up a little bit and to do it year after year not be mm -hmm. a pretender a year after year after year there's something, you know, there's some chemical imbalance or something, you know. I think we, let's, let's stay on that topic there that there's a lot of days you don't want to be there, mm -hmm. right? Because I think that becomes anybody that's aspiring, mm -hmm. you know, to, to do the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Have this false impression mm -hmm. that it's, it's like ACDC on the way to the gym every single fucking day. Yeah. You know, it's like, I can't wait to get there. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a long journey. It's a long process. It's a long journey where it's, you know, I've said in the past many times, I knew every road mm -hmm. to fucking turn off right. to not get there. <laughs> every fucking one. Right. Right. Never took it. Right. I can't tell you why I just did. Yeah, right? right. Where my first bunch of years there, never, mm -hmm. never, mm -hmm. you know, but it, it wears. Right. Yeah. And I don't know why or how but it wears mm -hmm. but then it's for a while it's like 20 percent of the time you know it's 30 percent. where would you say yours was that now granted you're there it's changed as soon as you walk in the door it's different mm -hmm. but getting there mm -hmm. you know like 30 40 percent of the time towards the last five six years it was in my head yeah i'd say the past couple years especially uh yeah like uh Physically, I can't go in there anymore. I just can't. And um, I think, I think before, you know, the old man, he he uh, he shows some belief in you that you've never felt before. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, in a way, you don't want to let him down. You know what I mean? So you mm -hmm. show up because you know he's going to show up, whether mm -hmm. he wants to or not. And like he would only sleep an hour a night. And so you're like, if this motherfucker can do this and be through what he's been through, and still show up, and he's a fucking hundred years old, why can't I? You know, mm -hmm. and so I, I feel like you felt you in a way you owed it to him mm -hmm. to be there. Like, like I said, I owed him felt like I owed him those five pro totals. Yeah. It's just, you know, whether he ever recognized it or not, you know, it's just what, yeah. you know, you felt like, you know, you owed it to him. Mm -hmm. 
with your after your kidney transplants you know you talked about you know not not going in because you didn't want them to see mm -hmm. that you're weak mm -hmm. right where one of the one of the reasons why i quit going mm -hmm. was physically i couldn't grab a bar anymore so there is that but right. that's a lame fucking excuse that's the low-hanging fruit right? <laughs> right it's you can throw it out there and nobody can die it is what it is yeah. um but i'm i'm falling apart right. you know and i couldn't see myself getting better mm -hmm. and that that was a probably the bigger reason mm -hmm. other than anything else you know other guys come in and fine whatever and then there was the bigger one which was i didn't want to be the poster child for you say you coming in mm -hmm. to say oh that's what i'm going to be like mm -hmm. 15 years from now mm -hmm. i'm going to have you know not be able to lift my arm over my head it's i couldn't do that mm -hmm. mentally mm -hmm. right and then with all that i couldn't i couldn't be in there if i couldn't be in there if that yeah. makes sense yeah yeah because west side's a, a big uh, mental, it's more it, it, majority of it. I, you know, it's mental. It, it, it's all mental. And if you can't, if you can't mentally put yourself in that frame, what what good are you yeah. being? You're just in the way. We need to back up your shit too. Right. Like if you're gonna, I can talk shit. I can still talk. I do it out here all the fucking time. <laughs> I can still talk shit, but you gotta be able to back it the fuck up. Right. You know, when right. you can't back up your own shit, then you're what you're worth. You know. Right. And it's 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 a conflicting thing because you know your worth could be you could still help people. Right. You know, and it's like, well, fuck, you know, how many helpers do they need? Right. You know, and it's, it's, it's a fucked up thing. You know, it's, it's weird, you know, to, mm. to wrap your head around mm. where I think you kind of saw some of it in that 10 mm. week period, mm. you know, after your transplant. Mm -hmm. Cause what do you want? You, it's not that you don't want them to see you being weak, right? Mm -hmm. It's also, you don't want them to see what they could actually Mm -hmm. be going through yeah you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah does that make sense yeah that and you know like you say the coaching thing like i i always just was like i'm not there to coach you know so i i felt out of place coaching you know like yeah. you know, so it's like i mean i coach the lifters up like during the sets or whatever yes, but yes. you know what i mean like be, not to be working out and just fucking stand there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i don't know i i wasn't ready for that at the time you know was he on you guys to Constantly looking at each other's form, technique, and all that. No, because I think we were all real good at that any, anyways. Like, you mm -hmm. know, we already, you know, we're trying to perfect technique, you know, with, you know, 1,000 pounds on mm -hmm. your back every Friday, you know? No, I know, but yeah. are you watching the guy you're training with? Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, for all those small details to tell them what they need to do. If if, if he fucked up, yeah. 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 If there was, yeah. Because that was that was one of the things that he ingrained in us yeah. that I've wondered if it yeah. carried through. Yeah, was it was our responsibility if we're in the same group. My responsibility is to make you better than me. Yeah, right. Because as soon as you become better than me, your responsibility is to make me better than you. Right. And the way that that happens is don't let anybody fucking slack for right. one. Right. You know, push them to right. and make sure everything they do is fucking technically sound. Yeah. Every rep they yeah. fucking do. Yeah. And that's where I had some problems when we moved from Demers to Larkham or mm -hmm. wherever the yeah. uh, West Belt, yeah. right? Is bigger. Well, it was small to you, right? It's, this is crazy, right? Because right? right. you walk in there and it's small and both yeah. sides are open. Right. To me, I'm used to this 400 square foot fucking place. Right. Where the group of two or three, you know how it works, two or three squat, two others are running the monolift and mm -hmm. you rotate through. Nobody can go anywhere. I mean, even if they're doing reverse hypers, it's literally from here right. to that right. that machine right there. Right. It's not that fucking right. far. Right. So you're in each other's space all the time. Yeah. Where we go over to West Belt, and so the first group goes, you know, squats, and then you go. And it's like, where the fuck did everybody? They're way on the other end of the gym doing reverse, and you're screaming at people. Yeah. Like, hey, asshole, can you come over here? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like I'm used to when when I squat. I'm squatting, Louis squat. I squat, Louis squat. Nobody, mm -hmm. they changed the box. They, you know, changed the way all, I'm not doing shit yeah. except squat, squat, squat. Yeah. Yeah. Then all of a sudden it's like, I got to change the box height and squat. Like, yeah. what the fuck? Yeah. You know, like, um, and did that reel back in? Uh, I mean, yeah, we would get on some guys a few times if they, because I, my group always went second. I don't know why, but yeah. we the weaker guys would go first, and yeah. then and then we would go just because I think it was too early in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Greg was probably still hungover, but yeah, uh, 
so we would help them a little bit and then if they scatter on us or whatever yeah they was you know they didn't do it twice you know what i mean like we brought them back you know they okay. they, they helped us you know run everything mm -hmm. i mean they were really they were they competed but they were more the handlers you know like mm -hmm. they weren't really yeah you know, nothing to write home about yeah but they're for, to me those that those lifters were always necessary yeah yeah I, right I, I think so yeah you know because it's there's different egos mm -hmm. different mindsets i suppose mm -hmm. you know i hate to say a and b you know but it's it's different mm -hmm. right where i didn't want the, the I, I didn't want many of the best lifters in the gym helping me to me mm -hmm. i no fuck no you know i know I, no, I, I take that back i want them there right their advice and guidance is valuable I don't want them fucking rapping me. Your knees, yep. You know, I don't want them doing any of that shit because I know what the fuck they're gonna do. Yeah. You know, it's it's gonna be way too. It's it's gonna be insane. Yeah. You know, so <clears throat> that separation was kind of important. Yeah. You know, with that. Yeah. Where when you were saying that, you know, Louis started to you know peel those guys out yeah. to bring the other ones in. That's yeah. why I asked. You know what what happened after that. Yeah. Like when you went to meets, did you, how did that work out? Some, some guys, uh, were good handlers that could still lift like AJ. He was yeah. a great handler. Yeah. He could keep me calm when I needed to be calm, amp me up when I gained EM. So some guys, some of those guys were good at that. I was never good at that. I was a lifter and that's what I was, you know, I couldn't wrap knees to save my life just because mm -hmm. I feel like I, I feel for me, if so, it's different then, but back then it was like, if the lifter missed after I helped him out, I felt like it was my fault, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because you, you just take it personal, you know? And it just might not have been their day, but like, fuck, I felt like it'd be my knee wrap or it'd be something, the mm -hmm. strap going tight, you know? So I took a lot of, you know, so I didn't like handling mm -hmm. our people at the time, you know, so. Um, but yeah, I, uh, he got rid of them and then it was kind of like, fuck, man, because we need them. And then some of the guys, you know, stepped up like AJ and whatever and, and would wrap knees and, and do whatever. And then he started bringing them kind of in more, you know, some more guys that could handle you know be the handlers at the meets and stuff mm -hmm. so. with with as we said and, and dave kind of clarified this when he's out here too with the average person he had a very he, he said a bunch of things that where i was like whoa <laughs> fuck you know this i didn't know this this is interesting as hell you know it's it's been it's and you know where he would notice patterns mm -hmm. you know people like two three years and they would just kind of get stale yeah and then it take off again but a lot of people two three years get stale leave, you know they yeah. leave um did you see any other the, the, first off did you see that same pattern or did you see other patterns as well yeah i the biggest thing i saw was guys would come from gyms where they were the big fish in a small pond yeah and their egos were frail and you know they would just you know they'd be there for a little while and then like they hurt themselves or say they hurt themselves and then you wouldn't see them ever again or the uh, get married and then they're gone, mm -hmm. you know, is and like one guy in particular I was training for me coming up and he got married didn't say nothing to like any of his training partners And then he's gone, you know, so like <laughs> Like what the fuck, you know, mm -hmm. like I never would have done that. You know, what I mean like that's just I don't know It's weird to me. I don't understand that. I understand it more now that I've gotten older, you know, I mean because uh, it's hard to uh, devote your life to lifting weights, you know, because mm -hmm. people want to do other things. You know, I, I understand that now. Back then, I didn't. You know? mm -hmm. I felt like you, whatever you latched onto, you need to put all your eggs in a basket and go. You, you know? think you needed the journeying to see that, or do you think yeah. just time? Yeah, time, time, everything, age, mm -hmm. the journeying. Uh, the journeying really opened my eyes to a lot of things. Um, I probably never would have uh, gotten the help that I needed for like. The bipolar disorder and all that stuff mm -hmm. had i not done that first and realized you know like something's off you know is is it safe to assume that powerlifting's in the back seat yeah um now i like to coach I, mm -hmm. as far as a competitor yeah i i probably will never compete again uh, every time i i get the itch i'm like man I don't know if I can go four days a week again, you know, and just like mm -hmm. burn myself. And it's like, I want to, I, I, I tell myself, well, I want to stay married. You know, like if I do this, I, it's probably, cause it's very selfish too. You know, mm -hmm. it's very self-centered and, and you can't go places cause you might be too beat up, you know, or, you know, because you did something, you know, it's all, you know, it's all round of that. And, and uh, I can't put myself, see myself doing that anymore. You know, I, there's no re you know, Louis passed away. I don't, I can't see myself getting another pro total. And, um, I just, I always said if Louie died, I would, I'd probably quit. And, and it's crazy because I was at the tail end anyways. And, mm -hmm. and then he passed and it's just like, yeah, that's a sign that, you know, I don't think so. You okay with it? 
Yeah. I, I wasn't for three years. And then uh, AJ and I went to a, the girls' pro-am, and, like, it was, like, almost like how we looked up to you guys. People were looking up to us. You know, it's so strange. It's a weird mm -hmm. feeling, you know, when somebody comes up, and I'm sure you get, you get it all the time. And it's like you're giving your answer and stuff, and it's just it's cool. I like, get in pictures with people mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, but I'd been out of it for three years, and it just opened something in me. I was like, man, I need to start co I need to coach and blah, blah, blah. And, and I tell you what, women's powerlifting is so cool. Before too long, there's going to be a 1,000-pound squat, you know, and, mm -hmm. and probably a 700-pound deadlift. It's just – it's crazy. Like, you know, and, and the men are, are cool, but, like, it's, all, it's already been done. Like, we've seen yeah. that, you know what yeah. I mean? So to see a woman do that, it's like, wow, you mm -hmm. know. So. What's, the, what's the most impressive thing? One of the questions that people asked, what was one of the most impressive things that you saw in the gym? In the gym, mm -hmm. uh, Tony Belloni, Tony Bellagoni. Uh, I think he raw squatted with a camera bar like a thousand pounds. Mm -hmm. uh, that was pretty impressive. Uh, watching hit what uh, one of the craziest things I'll, I'll answer that too was when Vlad attempted 1300 and his knee went the wrong way and he dropped the weight and about killed us all at the mm -hmm, same time. Mm -hmm. uh, that was crazy, you know. Um, yeah, Tony Bellagoni. He, it, he was probably the strongest man I ever seen. He didn't. It never carried. It carried over a little bit in the in the on the platform, but like he was just they call it retard strong, just mm -hmm. crazy strong. Just uh, and, it, and he wouldn't do it no technique. Like he'd shoot up and like look at Lou at the same time. He squat. It was the weirdest thing too. Mm -hmm. like, but Tony, man, he was strong. Um, I try to think. Uh, Greg did some crazy stuff, but I can't think of nothing on top of my head. He was just. With, with Vlad's 1300, what happened after that? I can just imagine, um, really, like, what happened after that? So it, it, it comes off, and Tony Belagoni, I was just talking about, um, was back squatting. The, the, the weight hits his arms. I was side spot. I thought it broke my arms. It came down on somebody's ankle. Because that that's when, right after that's when we started using the safety straps. We mm -hmm. never used them before that. And there was probably eight of us that it just took out because it went straight down. And I remember Vlad's joints and stuff were so big. They stand him up. And I look at his knee, I'm like, yeah, he might be all right it, because I mean his yeah. knees were already just huge. He had huge joints and tendons and stuff. He's just mm -hmm. a big man, and he that's when he ended up blowing his knee out. And since then he's come back and squatted like eleven hundred raw and deadlifted like nine hundred or something. It's mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was a crazy day. <sighs> Give me a bench one. A bench one. Um, let me think here. I would say, oh, yeah, uh, Burley Hawk and um, I can't think of his name, Chris, big Chris, like six foot ten Chris. Um, they both close gripped like 630 and 635. And that, I had never seen that before. Brawl, you know, no shirt. I don't even know if they wore wrist wraps. I, it was just crazy. And anybody who's met Burley or big Chris, like they are big men, you know. To see that, that was impressive, mm -hmm. you know. Because you may see one, but two people back to back like yeah. that, you know, like that's that's something. Yeah, that's that's special. Six foot ten. Yes, yeah, he's big, big, big. Like uh, his name's was on the board. He was the first or second night. He was the first nine hundred puller raw or whatever he did at hook grip. Yeah, he's a big man. Yeah. What do you weigh? Oh, at least probably four twenty, three eighty. But one of the biggest guys I ever mm -hmm. seen in my life. Just huge, mm -hmm. real nice too. Just laid back. Fucking just big, <laughs> big guy. Yeah. I see that you're doing seminars, yeah, right? Yeah. And uh, training, right? Yeah. So you're doing one to one training, but also online training as well. Mm -hmm. With how many of the seminars have you done? Uh, I've done three now. Yeah. And I have two coming up uh, this month, August 27th uh, in Charles, Charleston, uh, Charlesville, Charlottesville, excuse me, West Virginia. And then uh, September 10th, I'm doing one with AJ down in Texas. Yes. Yeah. With the ones that you've done, what are, what are some of the biggest disconnects that you see? Because it's, let me back it up a little bit, because there's, to me, there's a difference between conjugate training mm -hmm. and West Side training, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of people have taken conjugate and gone you know, in mm -hmm. many different directions, yeah. right? Yeah. So the, the only way I really know how to filter it in my, only, in my own brain, right? right? Because there's, there's conjugate for 8,000 things. Right. Just look right. it up. Right. You'll find conjugate for, right. type it, right. porn stars. You're going to fucking <laughs> find it, right? It's somebody's right. put it out. Yeah. Then there's the West side, right? Yeah. So let's 
forget about that and yeah. just say with the West Side when you're doing the seminars because it's I know what West Side was when I was there, mm -hmm. right? That's 18 years removed, right. you know. And conversations with Louis here and there, but right. take that for what it's worth. It's it's we weren't really talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, you're always talking about training with Louis, but it wasn't the main. Yeah, it was. It, <laughs> you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. it's it's, it's kind of in there. But um, what are some of the biggest disconnects that you're seeing? Probably um, the intensity and the uh, almost like fear to miss, like to go all out, you know. Um, and, and I would say when they, if they do miss, they don't, it's not like they put a hundred percent into it. You know, like, like people can't really grind nowadays or something like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just like either they get the weight or they don't. And it's just, that's something that missing. I think, um, it, a lot of it's attitude too, you know, like, uh, you could tell like, uh, on, on some of them, the intensity is just not, you know, like like we had it. You know, like it's just that's different. Are you talking? But are you talking about training? training well, let's weight? say you're doing a seminar, and that's that's what you're trying to help them with. Yeah, right. You're yeah. trying to teach Technique that and, and help them with all that. Yeah. You know how are you how are you explaining it to them so they get what you're talking about? Because you can say, look, max effort work. You can yeah. do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Right. But there's an intent. Yeah. Right. The intent actually trumps x y and z yeah right you can do five three one whatever the right. fuck you want to do <laughs> right. if the intent isn't what it's supposed yeah. to be yeah right so with that how how are you explaining to them what that intensity should be uh well the biggest one i, I would say off the top of my head would be like like we talked about the conditioning with the speed squats and stuff like that like you know break it up into two groups because they they want to do like eight a group of eight you know or whatever um like that's their training mm -hmm. group or whatever and it's like no man you got to break it into like two or three people and like it's you go he go he go he go you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um i would say that that type of intensity is lagging um yeah i see that everywhere every gym i've ever gone to that's that's you mm -hmm. know um that's a big one and uh i would say i don't see like uh a lot of gyms I've been to, I don't see sleds, like sled work or anything like that. I think so, a lot of that's probably missing. Or maybe they just have it at home. I don't know. But I don't see any of that at a lot of gyms either. Yeah. Um, that's about the two that pop into my mind right now. <laughs> the sled thing cracks me up because Brian Dubberduck, who was, he was out here this weekend, and it's one of the raw lifters that mm -hmm. we sponsored for a long time. And he was talking about all these, all these guys that will talk about how they do West Side training or conjugate training. Mm -hmm. And they do this and they do this and they do this and they're just fucking out of shape, right? Mm -hmm. They're just fat. So he'll always ask them, so that's what you do? And like, well, yeah, that's what we do. I said, well, what about the GPP? All right. And he's like, then they all just kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they just look down and walk away. Like yeah. they do, they do it, they do it, <laughs> right? But they don't. Do they it. put nothing into well, it. Well, they yeah. they don't even do the sled work. Oh yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. they they they're acting like that's what they do. Oh yeah. But they don't do the mundane, shitty stuff. Yeah. That actually contributes yeah. to being able to recover from what you're doing. I think that's the bad part about social media is everybody wants to be like Instagram famous, so they'll put the you know them doing the bench or whatever. But like, no sled work's kind of boring. So nobody mm -hmm. you don't see many videos on people just dragging sled. You know, yes. like, um So I they don't want to do it because they can't get likes on that you know or whatever yeah. you know so i think that that has something to do with it too and just pure laziness you know and yes so where do you have people start if they've not been doing the sled work or anything well first thing is i i always tell them you know you got to be in shape you know and so i'll break them up in groups and i can tell if their conditioning's there or not um if it's not there then i will tell them you know you need to start investing in like sled work you need to push your reverse hypers like we talked about mm -hmm. um you know as your auxiliaries, you need to push like 20, 30 reps. You know, you need to, you need to get in shape, you know, because a, a powerless to me, all that they see the nine lifts, but you got to be in pretty good shape to mm -hmm. take, go three for three on deadlifts. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you got to be in shape to, to do that. And I always, you know, I always would crack jokes because even at meets after bench, it seems like a lot of guys are ready to go home. You know, they, they'll take a deadlift or whatever, but it's not, you know, all they care about was the bench and the squat. Yeah. And like for me, like deadlift, that was the time, you know, cause that's when, where the placings are, you know, that could, that could, uh, from first to second, you know? And so, yeah, the conditioning's big, mm -hmm. I would say, yeah. So if they've never done sled work and say they're listening to us now, yeah. how, where would you put that in their program? Um, and where I, would they start? I would do it uh, probably three days a week. Okay. Um, 
I would have them do it uh, on uh, on their max day and their their speed day, and then like on a on an off day, like uh, uh, a Tuesday or, or a Saturday or something like that. Um, and I would just have them do uh, you know start out light and, and do like twelve trips, um, or if you have to work your way up to twelve trips, you know uh, trips about twenty five thirty yards. Um, and do as many as you can and then start put adding weight um as you get better with it and try to push you know uh, push your time see if you see if you can you know set your time and see how long it takes you to go down and back you know say it takes two minutes um you want to beat that time next time you do it you know I, I would do a lot of that type of conditioning um i would say you can get pretty good conditioning out of box jumps um that's another good one and prowler pushes if they have it you know how would you put the box jumps in um, I would have it on uh, lower body days, mm -hmm. um, like uh, more reps on uh, speed squat days, and then more like weighted jumps um, into a lower box. And, Before and the squats or after the squats? After, after, yeah, like probably one of the last movements to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then on max days, after you do your max, then do like the heavier um, box jumps, like your second exercise. Okay. Yeah. What other conditioning work? Um, so uh, conditioning work um, would be like, I would also like work with the belt squat, uh, walking for time. Um, if it's like uh, someone who's not into powerlifting, like they're like getting ready for fights, have one of those dummies on the belt mm -hmm. squat and like, you know, work with it or have a partner going inside, outside. Um, and it all for time, you know, depending on your sport, go for however long you're going to go. So let's say, you know, MMA fighters are five minutes. So they need to do five minutes all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I would that's I would push belt squats a lot. Uh, walk marching and marching, marching, yeah, mm -hmm. and um, belt squatting. Actually, belt squatting for you know high reps because you can get. Um, it's just a different way to set than you know normal squat. And for like us old guys, belt squats you know mm -hmm. are real good. Um, and you can get in shape that way, you know. And I would push the reverse hypers, you know, reps, um, 25, 30, 40 reps, you know, to get in shape. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's brutal, but you get in shape that way. Yeah. You know, you get in good shape. And then um, uh, walking uh, 15 to 30 minutes every day, you know, just um, you could put a vest on or put ankle weights on and just go for a brisk walk. Or, you know, you don't even need nothing on. Just go for a walk just, you know, to um, I feel like that helps with like lactic acid and the soreness too, break stuff up. Mm -hmm. And it gets you in a little bit of shape too. So. All right. So here, here's one of the questions that I said we were going to laugh about, right? Okay. So if you don't have the reverse hyper, yeah, what should they do? uh because so, you've never been asked that before right <laughs> um so you can do reverse hypers on an incline bench laying over it bringing your legs up or you can do it um off a uh you know those big stability med balls mm -hmm. you almost like making scorpions you can't do weight but you can do shit you can push 60 reps on that thing you know and and that i mean it it you know, stimulates it as much as possible. Um, with the incline or the, even the ball, you could put a dumbbell in your feet. You're not going to get as heavy as a regular you know, reverse hyper, mm -hmm. but you can put a, uh, you know, that and then do it. Or um, if you have the 45 degree back extension, really push it on that. You know, you can blow, you know, blow your low back up on that. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably about the only, you know, for that. If um, <clears throat> with with speed work, mm -hmm. there, there's an, there's another one, right? So. You know, like I said, I'm going to hit you with the questions you've been asked a thousand times because I've been asked a thousand times right, as well. Right. Um, <clears throat> what, do you, what do you say when people, well, I don't want to, I want to frame it a little bit different. What I want to say is what do you say when people say speed work doesn't work, but that's, let's take that out and say people don't see the value or the benefit in doing dynamic effort training. So what do you, when you're presenting or you're working with a new client and they're like, well, I thought that didn't work. So what are the reasons that you give them on to why it does? Well, one thing, I've never seen a, a thousand pound squatter slow. You know, it may look slow, but they're fast. You know what I mean? They're, they're squatting fast. Um, also, it gives you power. You know, speed, speed gives you power. Um, every one of us that could squat a thousand, we could all dunk a basketball. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, um, so if, if you're saying speed doesn't work, then I mean, the numbers from everybody who does speed work, you know, it, uh, tried and true, you know, it don't lie. It speaks for itself. Um, now some of the bench only guys, there's some strong guys who get away with not doing speed work, just bench only, but 
and I, I kind of see their thing. But for me, uh, like for squatting, definitely speed work definitely works. You know, I mean, um, it builds your conditioning up, um, it builds your body up, um, and you're able to handle more volume. Uh, over time, you know, over the sets than you could with just, you know, you know, if, if you can only you say you max squat uh, 600 or whatever, but you can do 350 for 10 sets of three or whatever fast, you know, that over the volume, you know, what's that's way more than 600, you know, mm -hmm. and so you can hone it a lo more load capacity, you know. With going to the, you said the benchers, you mm -hmm. can see them a reason why they wouldn't want to do that yeah so uh, what what would be that reason why just because like for guys that just bench it seems like they could really fine-tune like their triceps more or like their shoulders make those stronger you know um and like they can build their conditioning up or or their strength with their volume load by doing like sets of eight stuff like that heavy you know i've seen guys do a handle on that and i think that translate instead of speed work they do that so it's kind of the same thing but they're just not calling it speed work and they're not doing like say 10 sets of three or whatever they're doing like five sets of eight or, or whatever you know so um that i can kind of see you know why they do that uh but for me personally i think speed work you know where if you're trying to bench um especially like in a shirt i, I believe you need speed work you mm -hmm. know what what going back to the the dynamic squat mm -hmm. what about those people that will say that it's only going to work for those for multiply that it's not going to have value if you're raw uh no that that's that it's the same thing if you're raw you can handle you know the more volume and and whatnot um yeah i, I think speed work for raw squatting is good you, you need that too you know the the uh you know uh the dynamic of it uh to make you stronger overall you know it's i i've seen raw guys that do it and it works you know mm -hmm. so it, it, it's all because i've seen it work you know so like it yeah it is what it is you know yeah i know yeah no i get it i get it where with in a lot of the cases i'll say that so let's say it's dynamic box squats mm -hmm. just put that out as an example mm -hmm. and it's again I, i've seen it work you know mm -hmm. so there, there's that whole thing where other people won't see it. So then it will be more along the lines of, okay, let's just assume it doesn't work. Let's mm -hmm. say there is no, it doesn't make you more explosive. Let's mm -hmm. just say, we'll agree, let's say that does not work. Yeah. Um, doing eight sets of two is eight first reps mm -hmm. compared to a different program, which may be two sets of five, mm -hmm. which gives you two first reps. Mm -hmm. So if you're a competitive lifter, you compete on the first rep, right? Right. So now if we're going to talk technically, right. And, and you, you know, this just as well, that after two, maybe three reps, if you're really, really fucking good, you can maintain really, really tight technique for about three reps with effort, right? About the fourth, you're going to start kind of muscle fucking. It may still look good, but in your brain, you're kind of just muscle fucking it yeah, up, right? Yeah, getting looser too. So it, it's it's kind of going away. Yeah. So now we take that eight sets of two dynamic work, and let's just call it technical work, <laughs> right? So now yeah. we got sixteen proficiently executed technical reps, right? Compared to the person that may work up and do a heavy set of five. Yeah. So in one day, we did more technical reps than they're going to get in three weeks. Yeah. So that's assuming it's, that the yeah. explosive doesn't work. Right. It's just technical day now, right? Right. right. All right. Now we'll go with what you were talking about, which is the conditioning. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now let's just say the fucking technique doesn't matter, right? <laughs> the explosiveness doesn't matter, yeah. but you're just out of shape. Right. You're, you, you have no work capacity. So let's just take eight sets and put them on like 45 minute to 90 second rest intervals, put a lot of effort behind it. And then by the time you're done, you have to really, really, you're going to be in fucking shape after a three right. week wave. Right. You know, it's especially, you know, I, I've had people do three week waves of say 315 on the safety squat bar, just as an example, first week's 10 sets, second week, 15 sets, third week's 20 sets, yeah. first week, 90 seconds, second week, 60, third, 45. Do fucking 20 sets, yeah. 45. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. After that, you know, if I run through that, after that, I'm my work capacity, if it fell, it's right back. Right. Right. So with uh to those people with the dynamic work, mm -hmm. like, okay, I'll agree, but then I'll just say it's rep work. 
right? Right. Or, or right, we can even take it a step further and say, let's just shorten the rest period a little bit more. So 30 to 45 seconds and call it rest pause, <laughs> right? You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so now yeah. you're doing one big set yeah. of squats, you know, rest pause for 16 reps. Yeah, yeah. Hypertrophy training. Right, right. right? So w what part doesn't work? Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like how you want to frame the whole thing, mm -hmm. which becomes an interesting dynamic. And the the multiply thing, I've heard it for my whole, since 1990, yeah. you know, all the way back there. Yeah. People forget, you know, how many in coaches would come into Westside. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure it picked up. Yeah you know, after I left, right? Because yeah. Louis started to really lean into the the strength and conditioning outside of powerlifting. When I was there, it was still like powerlifting, powerlifting. And there was coaches coming in, but he was still like, right. you know, the power pulling. Then he started to like bend, yeah. you know, a little bit yeah. with MMA and then some other sports. Right. So I'm sure, you know, did the coaches start to come in far more often as you were there? Uh, for a while, for about yeah. the first five years, yeah. And then uh, Luke kind of did away with it. I mean, he'd have guys in once in a while, but it wasn't nowhere near, mm -hmm. you know, the first five years. Like, we had coaches from everywhere. They would stay in Columbus, like, for a month, and just we would kick the shit out of them, and they'd give us free T-shirts. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And that was great. But uh, he kind of, yeah, did away with it, you know, towards the tail end. Mm -hmm. um, didn't bring in guys for, like, weeks at a time. Like, a guy might come in for a day, you know, or a coach come in for a day. But, yeah, it wasn't. You know, they mm -hmm. wasn't like it was before, you know. Yeah. yeah. We Going back to, say, your online clients, I think I just saw you had somebody squat a grand. Yeah. Right? Reverse bang. Yeah. yeah. When you see that, how does that make you feel? Oh, it, it's, it's – so um, I, I, I'll i give you an example. I, I At the pro am I did have a client I coached, and it's almost like your first meet, but you're seeing it through somebody else's eyes. It's all about the different perception. Um because it's like my first meet as a coach and you know i don't i don't i'm nervous i'm just as nervous as she is because you know i want her to do well and she wants to do well you know and so it's just crazy how uh how how awesome you think that is when somebody does something that you know you've been trying to teach them because it's you know it's it's a part of you it's what i've learned you know throughout and it's just it's the greatest feeling next to you know you doing it yourself it, it feels like you did it yourself you know because you put your you put your heart and and, and your your soul into their training and then to see them do so well it's it's awesome incredible mm -hmm. feeling yeah it really is how long have you been doing this uh, i mean uh, let me step back for the people that are listening when, when you're at Westside, you're always coaching, you're always right, helping, right, right? right? So that that is part of the resume. Right. Any way that says it isn't has never been there. Right. It's part of the resume. Now, helping people outside of there, how long have you been doing that? Uh, as far as like, um, like, so I've been doing it forever, but yeah. um, as far as like really to toning in on it, like the past six months, okay, past year or something like mm -hmm. that, like where I've really been like, yeah, this is my calling. This mm -hmm. is what I want to do. Like this is this is awesome. I'm also a teacher's aide at a preschool, and I don't make much money at it. But I work part time, but like I I do it for the experience. I just I love them kids, man. You know, it's just and and kids don't have a lot of like male. Um, role models you know like guys that can because a lot of men don't work in the school you know especially mm -hmm. that young and if they do they're usually like creeps or whatever mm -hmm. and so like i stay you know they treat me like kindergarten cop or whatever you know they <laughs> go up mm -hmm. and down. so I, it's just the experience you know and and i love coaching and uh, i love seeing people getting stronger and, and, and all that it's just i feel like i have a lot of knowledge on the strength game that needs to pass out before you know before i die and that's i feel like that's my calling you know what do you mean by calling like uh i mean you know, like, that's what I was sent to do, you know, like, uh, like from, if you believe in God or whatever, like God, this is what he wanted me to do. Like get the knowledge out that I've learned and spread it as much as possible to as many people that want to listen. So all the training that you've done, yeah. all the competing that you've done, yeah. all the adversity, yeah. you know, that you've had to go through yeah. is brought you to this point. Yeah. And that's what you feel. Yeah. I would still be competing if I never got sick. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for sure. If, if it's your calling, right, mm -hmm. and you would still be competing, you see what I'm saying? Then 
would you still be co if you're still competing you wouldn't be coaching Coach, no i wouldn't no 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 and that's why you said all that stuff yes. had to happen so all that had to happen to yeah. bring you where you are now exactly yeah right exactly. and the where you are now are you are you at peace with that yeah 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 i i get to go in the gym every day i do a little bit you know here and there um i'm still able to move you know and be as free as possible as much as i am and uh yeah i I, I love coaching. So like the competing, I don't even think about it anymore. Like I was just almost like a past life. Like this, the coaching is like all I think about now. Like, cause I'm like, I guess an obsessed in a way, like, cause I want to see everybody that I'm working with do better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I, I really think all that had to happen for me to, to do that. Cause God definitely was giving me signals, you know, way back in 2010, like with the five stage kidney failure, like, you know, you need to do this, but I was kind of stubborn. It took me a couple of times, but yeah, mm -hmm. now I see it. And I feel like this is what I was meant to do. Where's the teacher's aid fit in here? Um, how did that come about? I, I was having trouble getting clients. And so I just Google searched the job. And I was like, you know what? I might be all right at this because I, I love kids. So I'll give you an example. Last Friday, I saw this paint. They, they had paint sitting out. And I was like, we're going to make warriors today. So we, we face painted all this and took pictures and stuff. It was cool. Some of the parents liked it. Some of them didn't, mm -hmm. you know. But, like, just stuff like that, like, out of, th out of the box thing. And, like, I, I make them play, like, wiffle ball and, and, and kickball and, and, like, try to be kind of physically fit. And, like, you know, we exercise a little bit and stuff like that. Because, like, if not, they just go in there and play with toys and, and, and wait to leave or, or, you know, read a book, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I try to bring a little bit of something out of the box, you know, and make it, you know almost memorable in a way like they might not remember who i am or, or what i look like or whatever but they'll remember maybe that yeah they got to paint their face you know yeah. at school for for a day and something like that yeah. you know just how long you been doing this uh about a year now mm -hmm. yeah yeah well give me some other examples of the face paint of you know things that you did that come to mind real quick uh like i said uh i had i made sure they got a bat and a ball to for wiffle ball like none of them want, had sporting stuff um kickball um we uh we can't really play dodgeball but sometimes we kind of mm -hmm. do you know stuff like that yeah a bunch of act just different activities you know what what have you seen happen after they begin to master one of these activities oh man um so like a lot of them don't want to do it you know like they don't want to learn like the, but then after they like play two innings like they don't stop you know they love it yeah. you know and and like to see a kid like connect with a ball you know and to see his face light up you know it's it's just cool you know yeah. it's just, don't want to do it what do you mean like uh i i don't know like like a, the generation you know like just laziness like mm -hmm. they they're all brought up on computers and and phones and stuff and it, it's unlike when we were kids you know you had to go outside and have an imagination and stuff so that they just want to kind of just hang out outside when we have outside time now you know mm -hmm. sometimes we're going to do something you know and and uh they all have fun when after they do it you know they're all just just think it's the greatest thing, but to get them to do it's kind of the hard part, you know. Like you just got to motivate them, I guess. Yeah. So that after they do, yeah, then yeah, then the majority of them are like, man, this is cool. Especially after they hit, because I think they're kind of don't want to do it because they don't think they can hit the ball or whatever, you know. And then once they do, they're just like, man, this is cool. And to see one like hit a home run or whatever, it's it's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When when you were that age, did you have somebody in your life that was helping you to kind of do that same thing? No. Nah. Yeah my mom but it, that's not a that's not a you know a uh, father fit you know not, mm -hmm, not, you know mm -hmm. so you know no. do you think that's why you're doing it part of it yeah 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 i i, I uh yeah for sure yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah why do you think so um i think it's just because well because i worked in a prison for uh eight years and I just I see a lot of guys why they're in you know I'll just say the creeps you know for touching kids or whatever and I f feel like anybody that like you always see like men that work schools are like they're creeps you know what I mean mm -hmm. and so I, I feel like kids don't have a solid man in their life you know I, and, and I'm not saying nothing about their yeah, dads yeah. or nothing yeah. but you know like like a teacher type you know that's you know uh, more of like a, a manlier type and so I feel like that's what keeps me there because I feel like they need that kind of authority or, or whatever you know mm -hmm. they need that you know you need a, 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 a woman and a man to help you you know to raise you and i think a lot of uh their men solid men are just lagging right now mm -hmm. in, in in america especially but what pushed you to want to do this i i think it's just you know um 
just because I kind of had a rough upbringing. I don't want the kids to kind of go through the same thing. So for three hours or four hours a day, if they can hang out with me and we can have a good day, you know, uh, I, I, you know, that's, that's what I want to, I want to do. I want to feel, I guess I feel like I'm, uh, contributing or, or like almost like that's my charity work or whatever, mm -hmm. just helping these kids. Cause I, I want to see them, you know, do good, you know, and, and be good, be good, be good citizens and, and, the, and productive in the, in the world. Do you feel that you couldn't have that impact when you were in the, the prison system or the, before that it was, um, it was juvenile, right? Juveniles. Yeah. But what, what was that? I mean, what, it's not a correction. It was a, what the hell they call the, that? Uh, uh, youth leader. Youth leader. Yeah. Do you think that was too late? Mm. We're now working with juveniles and, and uh, five to seven year olds, totally different. Yeah, no, no, I get, I get that. I get that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, you've seen what can come out the other end. Right. Right, right on the bad side right through the prison system and through right. that right? Right. right where now you're able to get at the at the closer at the beginning yeah you know and yeah, yeah i feel like if i have a bigger impact on these kids like now they won't end up that way down the road you know like if they can start on a good path yeah because i feel like children are you know adults are only you know product of their environment and how they were raised you know majority of them mm -hmm. You know, and if they see good, you know, majority of the time, they'll be more good, you know, more apt mm -hmm. to, you know, want to be good or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. And so I feel like if I can get them on kind of a straight, you know, like have some structure in their life, you know, and and uh, some discipline, that goes a long way in life, you know, like sports and all that, you know, it's just, it's, it's great. It teaches you so much about, you know, being a man when you get older, you know. I think having the right people show up in your life makes a huge difference yeah. too yeah. right there's you know i can name several people throughout my life that you know either just said one thing or one conversation and it was a defining moment yeah you know it's it's this way or this way and it yeah. you know it directed that way you yeah. know louis was one of those people yeah. for me and i'm sure he was probably one of those people for you for sure you know that that's defining moment mm -hmm. you know that changes your life mm -hmm. in a completely different direction yeah better direction yeah you know compared to others it, you know yeah. way better direction yeah and now you're in that position mm -hmm. you know is is a powerlifting coach right mm -hmm. and the seminars and you know mm -hmm. this assistant youth leader whatever you want to you know right right i went how does that make you feel being knowing that right because when you're in the day-to-day -day, you don't know it yeah you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I've gone back and have, have thanked these people yeah. that have made these difference in yeah. my life, yeah. right? Not one of them knew. Well, not one of them knew, mm -hmm. right? Louis just told me shut the fuck up, <laughs> right? But because you know he wasn't going to listen yeah. to shit like that, right? You know, but they didn't know, yeah. which was kind of surprising to me, yeah, right? Because you just assume, right? Like we all assume, right? You know that they just know, yeah, but they don't, which makes you wonder, you know, if if you're a person that's in that position that can can make that difference yeah you know do you really realize no the no. difference that you could make no you you don't and that was something like i said when i went to the uh the women's pro-am like i didn't realize i had an impact on people until i went there recently because like i said i was out for three years i didn't have nothing to do with powerlifting and when i went there and people were coming up asking questions and this and that i was like man i do have an impact you know like I, you know, and some days when the kids are misbehaving, I feel like, I, you know, I'm not doing anything. But then, like, I was gone for two weeks and came back, and they're all, like, hugging me and stuff. So it's like, I, I you know, I clearly they, they miss me enough to where I am, you know, somewhat of an impact in their life. And, mm -hmm. and that's just a great feeling. Like, I feel like I, you know, makes me want to be more responsible with, with everything that I do, you know, just not get careless with anything and, and still stay a good human being in society. You know, mm -hmm. it, just, it motivates me. So that, that hamstring tear, you know what I'm saying? Or the, the, the oblique tear, yeah. you know, to go way back. The yeah. oblique tear, that, that 800 deadlift, yeah. you know, to be able to stay in the meet yeah. compared to those kids running up to you after you being gone for two weeks. Oh, man. I don't know. It's just a different, different it's a different, <laughs> feel, it's a good feeling. You know, it's just a different feeling. Like, um, I, I can't really explain it. Like, um, it was, a, it, yeah, it's just, it's just a different feeling. It's more like, 
almost like you're like a, a father figure to these guys. It's like, you know, you just, you just feel so like, you know, I, not a I don't know, like a, a brother in a way. I don't know how mm -hmm. you want to explain it, but it's just, um, yeah, it's just a different feeling, it, it, but it, they're both equally the same. You know, like, mm -hmm. I can't, I can't say one's better than the other, but I tell you what, now this part of life, I say, I would say that the kids mean more to me than the 800 pound yeah. deadlift, you know? With with what you know now about training, and I know this is a fucked up question because I've been asked it, and I don't even <laughs> like to answer it myself, right? With what you know now about training, mm -hmm. if you could go back, what parts of the way that you trained, and I know we can't, right. like that would be my answer. It's a stupid question. We can't fucking right. do it. But there are things that you've learned, mm -hmm. you know, about training, you know, you know, forget about the journey and the experience right, and all right, that, right. you know, go back to Luke, mm. one hundred percent, just training, right? Right. With what you knew towards the end of that career, what would you go back and tell yourself when you first came into Westside? Like, what would be the advice as far as do more of this, do less of this? It would actually probably be do less, like closer to a meet, like more like a deload, or or you know that we didn't get to go full tilt, a uh, hundred miles an hour every workout you know what i mean um especially towards the meet i would have deloaded a little more um i feel like my cns would have thanked me for that you know because it always seemed like a week after meet you know because you take that week mm -hmm. off or whatever you're always like super strong you know like the, ne the next week or whatever and so i that i was never able to like perfect you know i was never able to take enough time off because it was just always do you think it was a time off or do you think it was a band tension or what do, you, what do you think played into that more? Uh, all, all of it. Yeah, the band, t yeah. I would say just, you know, we always had some sort of heavy tension and heavy weight and, and never just, you know, uh, doing an actual, like, deload, you know? Yeah. And, and just seeing how you, because, you know, you feel like if you don't, if you deload, you're like, oh, I'm going to be weak, you know, mm -hmm. like you have to train. And so I th feel like if we would have deloaded a little better, we would have all probably all I know I would have been. What stronger. would that have looked like? Just like um, a like a fourth week with lighter tension or just longer probably, time off? Probably just longer time off. Yeah. Yeah. I think even because we were in good shape, you know. Yeah. Maybe just come in, do hyper, you know, do yeah. the necessary stuff, hyper sled drag, stuff like that. Nothing that's gonna like super tax your CNS. You know? So how far out was your last heavy squat? Was it two or three weeks? Um well we started changing it to where it was the heaviest was three weeks, and then two weeks out we would do like a percentage off of what we hit for like three doubles or whatever. Mm -hmm. It used to be the other way, but, and then the week after we would take like a, a squat for like 50% raw or whatever of mm -hmm. what we plan on hitting at the meet or whatever. And then it was the meet, you know, so we didn't really ever take any, you know, yeah. actual time off. So would you have pulled those last two or just the last one? I would have pulled the last one for sure. Yeah. Um, maybe, uh maybe not as much band tension on the second week you yeah. know what i mean like hit yeah. that on the third week and then like take it down to like a green band mm -hmm. and hit 50 percent or whatever we were working mm -hmm. up to 60 percent or whatever um yeah that's how i probably would have done it now was your last uh, granted you didn't pull a lot of any, but was your last heavy pull three weeks it was uh no um uh, we would pull an opener we started pulling an opener um two weeks out on a monday yeah yeah so we take the certain max squat and then we would take the the pole after, after the second week circuit max. We would take the pole on Monday, and then we take the floor press ten days out on a Wednesday. Okay. And then yeah. So the floor press is more your test. Yeah. Right to know where you, Free bench, where yeah. your opener and shit yeah. is going to be at. Yeah. So that with the bench, would you have changed that? Mm, I think the bench training was pretty good. Yeah. 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 I think there's more room for error. Too, yeah. You yeah. know, with that, where the squat. Pole. Yeah. Well, well, Louis was always just like big on eight, being able to use the bench shirts, but he wasn't big on like using suits for deadlifts and squats. You know what I mean? Like he would rather you, uh, it, it was, you know, it was, mm -hmm. you know how it is. Like mm -hmm. Louis just, mm -hmm. you know, any more than briefs other than circuit max and, and that was suit bottoms down. Well, you train on bands all the time for, so for, for a year and then you go to a meet, you're like this because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. almost like a monolith keep you in, in place. Mm -hmm. That's where I think chains have their advantage because yeah. they rock you. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to do a circuit max with chains. I never did, but that was what something I would probably change too. Is I would have tried to do it with chains just to build that stability factor for when you take yeah. a squat. Do, do you think the the bands have a, had a grounding effect? Yeah, I, I think it. Uh, like I said, I think it, it, 
they're great because yeah, i mean yeah, yeah. It, it teaches you strain it teaches mm. you you know a lot of things but i think it just like a, like you know like a um not a monolith but a, a smith machine yeah, yeah, yeah. Smith, it just yeah. keeps you in place you know yeah. so you don't have to worry about stability mm -hmm. and all that as long as your feet are you know you don't have to worry about where you put your feet you know just you know where yeah. that band tension's at yeah if you if you got i always thought if you got yourself set in the right position with the bands mm -hmm. assuming that you're in midfoot to the bands whatever yeah. you know it's going to be it was like two extra feet. Yeah. It was harder. Yeah. Fuck yeah. It was harder. It was yeah. hard as fuck at the yeah. top. It was hard as hell. Yeah. But balancing was never a problem. No. Because I felt it was like you said, it was like two extra feet. Yeah. Where you took them off. It was like, oh shit. Yeah. yeah. You know, what What am I supposed to do here? You know, whereas, you know, I don't, that was one of those things that if I was to answer that same question looking back, it'd be like, no, nah, I need to put the gear on somewhere yeah. without that shit, yeah. you know, just to kind of get used to yeah. how it was f to feel, right? you know, which that becomes tricky too, right. you know, cause that's a fuck ton of weight to recover from. Yeah. You know, we started throwing that in towards the end of last couple of years. We started doing that, putting suits on yeah. um, like on Mondays or Fridays and taking max quest just so we can get used like probably once a month. So we get, maybe once every six weeks, something like that. So we yeah. can get used to, the, that, that what we're talking about that stability yeah. and you and actual weight you know because down in the hole when the chains or the bands release sometimes you need to feel that shit mm -hmm. you need to feel all nine hundred thousand pounds in the hole because that's where it's going to be at a meet you know what i mean so mm -hmm. it's just it's just you know i think it was better to do that yes you know it's just be, i think if anything it built confidence yeah you know, when you went into a meet you knew that you're going to be sturdy when you stood up with that squat you know and that was that was year round that you would for, have that in toward, there, yeah. Towards probably the last three years that I was competing there, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. With uh, with the clients that you're working with now, are you making some of these changes with the programs that you're putting together with them? Assuming that they're geared, you know, you could have raw clients too. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, de depending on um, like their strength level and all that stuff, and and where they're at and what they're doing, and um, yeah, I I definitely do make changes. Like one big change is. So uh, some of the, the ladies I work with, um, they compete raw, but um, their circuit max will be like a reverse band, uh, no box, you know, making sure that they know they can hit depth. Even though we train for it in a box, you still got to be, mm -hmm. you know, no box there. You got to feel what that's like, you know, mm -hmm. without it. So that's that's a different, you know, mm -hmm. change. Um, but it seems to carry over good, you know. So The one thing that I found with the box and – carry over mm -hmm. you know with athletes raw lifters whatever it was was the biggest component that i found was they have to squat on the box the same way they squat free yeah right so if they're going to squat on the box you know super wide sitting way back right but then their raw squat is closer stance knee about midfoot right there's the correspondence is not going to be what they think it's going to be right right so if that's how they're going to squat raw Right? And they're not going to change it. Yeah. You know, then they need to box squat. Yeah. The same freaking way. Right. You know, it just right. It makes sense to me. Right. right? Where I think um, a lot of people do the exact opposite. Yeah. Like they 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 how they box squat is not how they free squat. Gear as well. To yeah. be completely honest with you, yeah. gear as well. Yeah. You know, some some people will find an easier way yeah. to box squat. Yeah. Maybe sit, roll, roll, yeah. cut, <laughs> right, right? right? You know, or um, sit back further. Yeah. Instead of with the gear now, it's more flaring. Yeah. You know, and trying to keep Flare, the yeah. you know down. They they don't do it the same. Yeah, I I notice a lot of people don't know how to box squat. Like they'll touch their hamstrings and go up, or like touch and go, touch the box and mm -hmm. go, and and that's not you know you have to go there and and your hips are so activated, but they're you're you know you're sitting, you know you're mm -hmm. resting, and then you know not resting, but you yeah. know what I mean, like yeah, resting yeah. your hips and then go. Um, a lot of people don't, you know, they they touch the hamstrings and go up, or their box height's yeah. not right, and it's I don't know, it's it's annoying to yeah. watch. How that. have you had success explaining that to people when you're working with them? Um, well, I, I demonstrate it. I, I usually lead by example, you know, mm -hmm. and show them this is how you need to do it. And and then we just perfect it. You know, we we work it. And then if they like say their knee comes in that, you know, they, they they're good enough right now that they know when their knee comes in, you know, they can, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I'll tell them and, and then we'll work on it. We just we just pound technique and, mm -hmm. and keep everything, you know, the best way that they can. The box is a tough one, though, because it's they you're you're right. Yeah. You allow them just. Yeah. touch and go yeah right or they sit way too much yeah like they, they release way too much yeah <laughs> and it's, so it's 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 hard man because yeah. you're like 
no, only release like um, 40%. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, right. it's, it's, it's this weird thing. Like you got to stay tight, but yeah. I don't want you to hover, right. you know, right over the box. Right. You know, it's, that's why I asked, you know, how do you explain it? And yeah. showing them obviously is the best way, yeah. you know, to go about it yeah. because it's, it's a, it's a tough one, yeah. you know, especially if they've never done it. Right. Because they do those two extremes. Yeah. Where they, obviously with everything, the answer's somewhere in the middle, but we, we forgot that in this <laughs> fucking country, right? You know? But <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. The, um, so some of your, some of the lifters you're working with are raw. Yeah. Do yeah. you change anything with uh, the West Side Protocol? Um, you can't. When you're raw, I noticed when, like, I lifted raw, you can't pound the CNS as much as when you're wearing gear. You know, like, even though we train raw, a lot of times we had briefs on at Westside, and that, you know, that can, you can handle more load and more CNS training with that mm -hmm. than, than uh, raw lifters. I do, I believe mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, how do you, what do you change with that? The percentages? Uh, so, or? yeah, like, like the volume uh, won't be as high, or like, I'll have, after like say they squat, I'll let them have like longer rest periods for like auxiliary work or um, you know between exercises instead of like okay we'll pick up and go you know mm -hmm. um, because you know I don't and then I don't use as much band tension either mm -hmm. um, just because I you know I don't I don't want them to be fried I want them to be strong every day possible you know mm -hmm. I want them to be recovered so strong for the accessories right and and for the next day you know, yeah. for all the, you know, the, all the week that they're working out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. As their work capacity increases, yeah. you know, then you'll change that. I mm -hmm. assume. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Like, uh, I train a lady, her name's Gail and she's a 66 year old cancer survivor. Badass. I, I mm -hmm. love her. And anyways, uh, her hypers have gone through the roof and she just hit like a 55 pound pin pull because of hypers, you know? And so like, for example, you know, we started, we had to start kind of low when I took her over like six months ago. And now she's doing, you know, good amount of weight for 30 reps, you know, heavyweight, like 240 pounds and, and just crushing it. And then she's killing it on, on her main lifts. It's showing on her main lifts, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I had to start out, you know, low and then kind of gradually work her up, you know? With, with the accessories, with the raw lifters that you're working with, mm -hmm. what are the ones like that, that you find people have the greatest success carrying over to their lifts with what exercise yeah what, what movements so you have go-to movements like yeah. here's the, what we're going to put in first because yeah. you know they're going to work and yeah. if they don't work you'll slide it out put something else so in. the biggest thing i noticed uh when i went to that meet was a lot of girls were folding over and i've mm -hmm. seen this in a lot of videos mid back's not worked like nearly as much as it should be uh so that's one big thing is as people who who train with me is we do a lot of mid back uh four days a week and um, because I want them to stay, you know, up and, mm -hmm. and tight as much as possible. And it's helped tremendously. That's, that's one, one of my staples there and reverse hypers. Definitely. Yeah. So what are you having them do for the mid back? Uh, rows, a lot of rows, uh, reverse grip rows, barbell rows, uh, bent, uh, you know, regular bent rows, mm -hmm. uh, dumbbell rows, uh, rows off the reverse hyper. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, variations of pull downs, um, pull ups, if they can do some pull ups, um, uh, but hitting the mid back every time they come. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. Uh, T bar rows. Yeah, yes. yeah. Is yeah. this in the the beginning of the training or towards the end of the training? Um, usually it'll be like about mid midway. Yeah. Sometimes right after the main lift. Mm -hmm. It depends. Like if they're really weak, it'll, it'll be them after the main lift. You know, because yeah. we're going to build that. Um, if it's getting stronger, it'll be towards the mid, and then it's, it might make its way to the end. Sometimes if uh, you know if they have a good mid back. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if, definitely if it in the middle to beginning special for beginners or you know even intermediate lifters yeah what do you see with the bench oh um the bench would be uh lockout power i would say triceps a lot of triceps mm -hmm. um it seems like people are real good from here to here and then from here it's just so we'll do pen presses and we'll do uh a lot of tricep work, close grip benches, JM presses with the uh, safety squat bar is one mm -hmm. of my favorites. Um, and a lot of rollbacks and tape presses and all that mm -hmm. stuff, but I, you know, with dumbbell work, I, those are probably my go-tos on, on bench for bench. Yeah. And what now, what about the deadlift? Now, granted, I is the squat and the deadlift. I think the weaknesses correlate, yeah, right? Yeah. So a lot of mid back. Work, yeah, yeah. So the same thing. Yeah. 
have you found that same thing that whatever the weakness is in the squat typically is always going to be for the most part yeah, if, yeah. unless if somebody's a freak deadlifter you know like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's about the same yeah okay um are you working with anybody that's not a power lifter or just um, i was working with two mma fighters for a yeah. while um and i i just recently stopped working with them but yeah i was working with them for for about a year how know. did you change the dynamic work for instance and then we'll get into the max effort work so for the fighters i would only train them three times a week and on their third day would be dynamic lower and upper so it'd be more conditioning type training mm -hmm. um so they would do dynamic squat and then a few lower body stuff and then they would do dynamic bench and upper body stuff in the same workout we get it done about an hour mm -hmm. um one thing that's crazy about those fighters is their conditioning is just non-stop and and they can just go and go and go. So you just, for an hour, you just pick exercises and just <laughs> try Well, with the dynamic, what sets and reps? I mean, it's... it's it was the same. The like same. like okay. 12, 10, 8. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the bench would be like nine sets of three. Yeah. Uh, but it would just be combined, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now that max effort day, mm -hmm. what would you have them do there? Um, it would depend... A lot of times for upper body, it would be their shoulders. Uh, a lot of shoulder strength stuff, military press, dumbbell presses. Um, for lower body, um, we would do like a, a rotation, like uh, a deadlift one week, uh, good morning one week, uh, a squat one week, and then like a deload week. So it'd be like four. Singles, triples? Um, it just, usually we would do triples to singles, sometimes max fives. Yeah. But yeah, you know, um, just, yeah. Um, sometimes we would, for like deload, you know, we would do, you know, 10, 20 reps, 30 reps, you know, whatever mm -hmm. for, for just, you know, a, a, like for definitely, I push, definitely they push the uh, hypers, you know, like tons of reps on that. Yes. Yeah. So the, the with the accessories, say I call it supplemental, like the yeah. second exercise is supplemental, yeah. then it's accessories. Yeah. Were, were the reps higher for them? Yeah. Yeah, know, and, and all then the way there, through. Yeah, and then there was always conditioning work too at the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what's some of the conditioning work? Just as uh, so, like the belt squat thing. Yeah. Uh, so we called these the Coleman crawls. Mark Coleman, you know the UFC mm -hmm. fighter. I don't know what the name is. He, he had another name for him. I didn't call him the cocksuckers, but mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was like prowler pushes with the sled, um, and they'd go all. I mean, they would do probably fifty yards down and fifty yards back, and that that was a hell of a conditioning mm -hmm. workout with you know. Uh, like 100, 100, 200 pounds on the sled, something like that. I mean, yeah, that's a that's a man nice. maker right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would have them have that power pole on and like dumbbells sometimes or just that, and they'd walk around like about a mile um, and, I, you know, time it. Um, shoulder presses like this, have it up the whole way walking around or dumbbell presses while they're, you know, have a sled. Yeah, with the sled. Them. Yeah, yeah. And then um, – I'd had, we had this tread sled, but it's it's a better than a tread sled because it moves a little bit, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we would do one minute sprints, thirty seconds, like walk, and we do that for fifteen minutes, and whew, that was a man maker right there. So go through that again. So it'd be a one minute, one minute sprint. Yeah, go as fast as they can. Okay, and they had to keep their RPMs uh, up to like a certain, uh, yeah, you know, like fifteen or whatever it was, and. Um, or their speed at 15 or whatever. And then they'd get a 30 second rest. They could do whatever for 30 seconds, you mm -hmm. know, they can walk on it. They can, it was easier if they walked on it, but sometimes, yeah. you know, you, you, you'd have to stop. But then at that minute, they'd, they'd have to sprint again. So they do that for 15 minutes. Well, so it ended up being longer than that if you count the halves, but yeah, 15 rounds of one minute. Mm -hmm. And that, that got them in good shape, real good shape. When there's a difference between training them yeah. and training, you know, the lifter power yeah. lifters right yeah. <clears throat> which one did you it's i i can't it's a fucked up question i was gonna say which one do you like training most but it's different yeah you know so it's i it's a different if i can't answer the question myself i'm not gonna <laughs> ask it right because it's just different it's yeah. like a different beast they're they're both cool in their own way yeah, they, right yeah. you know yeah. it's just it take that question back it's fucked up right <laughs> if I, like i said if i can't answer i'm not gonna fucking ask um with the um let me go through my the other oh okay here we go right. how much band chain t should you use there's there there's there's a question that every west sider ever has been asked how much band tension how much band tension should you use as far as like a percentage off of <laughs> whatever you know the question right yeah you're walking around to meet somewhere and like hey man you used to train at west side yeah tell me something how much band tension am i supposed to use uh, i mean <laughs> <laughs> I hate asking this shit. <laughs> um, 
percent. Go, I think it, percent. I think it's about like twenty five percent of your max, yeah, yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, that, I know it depends. As, right? Yeah, as far as my training, it, that's a hard question because like when we trained, we did more than that. Yeah, you know, we were yeah. using a ton of band tension. Yeah, or a ton of chains. So, but I think it's like twenty five percent. That's what you should, yeah. for, especially for dynamic. You know, I think it's a good place to start. I think what. What might be cool to do here is, because a lot of these answers are it depends, right? Yeah, right? So, well, let's just take this one and just talk about why it depends, yeah. right? So, yes, you could use more band tension because you're used to using bands. Right. You've been acclimated to it. Right. You know, it's when when I was there, it's, there were no bands. Yeah. I mean, fuck, there are no chains. There are no <laughs> bands, no chains, just straight weight. Right. So, I like to tell people when they say, well, when should I start using bands, right? And I, I don't know what Louis thought is on that this is just what i say just being dickhead you know i was like well you know i had 10 years of competing before coming to west side so there's that right and then i was there for three or four years we only had straight weight yeah then chains came in yeah. then we used chains for about a year and a half two yeah. years then bands came in yeah. you know so i had all you know so use chains for two years and, you know, whatever <laughs> gonna, and then the bands when first the first training session we had with that was just a blue you know no fucking five board tight of the monolift yeah. you know just the blue yeah. it wasn't even it wasn't even choked it was just put i mean it fucking right. flapped and you know it was, <laughs> you know it's like that was the first so right. then we choked it yeah. you know and we went from that blue yeah. and my squat blew up i yeah. mean it, my squat went up 50 pounds just with the chains joe amato as well and then we both used the bands and it went up another fit it's like gee this, we just put a hundred Yo. you know in a fucking year yeah. from these things but it was a blue it was the wave was 400 to 455 over three weeks Yo. with a choked blue band yeah on the regular model with no duct tape four by four you know what I'm saying? right people right. don't know what we're talking about but it, it's it made a huge yeah, difference makes a difference then like two years later there's three fucking blue and five plates i'm like what the fuck you know but you i think some of that is you become acclimated yeah you know to it i do think in in later years louis just threw people in the fire yeah like, this is what you do yep. right and i think it bit some people in the dick because of that yeah. uh, maybe he changed it maybe he didn't but that's one of those depends things, yeah. right? Where if you've already gone through three or four training phases with 10, 15%, whatever it is, yeah. without a lot of tension at the bottom, then you're going to put a little more on. Right. It's the same way you do with weight. Right. You know, you get stronger, you put a little bit more weight right. on. You get, you right. put a little, and so that there's a big variance, right. man. You know, and it's, well, if, uh, I, anybody who's never done bands, they need to start out slow. That's for sure. Yeah. I, I, I remember the first day I ever used bands, it was at a public gym and there was green bands choked. I was an 800 pound squatter at the time, 816, something like that. And 315 plus the green band, I mean, it took everything I had to get up. I get killed. I didn't have no briefs on, but it about mm -hmm. killed me. You know what I mean? Like it was hard, hard, like stapled me. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, and then you just finally you start getting used to the band tension. and then i went over to when i go when i started training with gabe and we started you know my squat went from 800 to 920 just from getting used to the bands and adding more bands and being able to handle you mm -hmm. know more weight than i was ever going to squat you know mm -hmm. especially at the top and, and so yeah i think you need to start out low and eventually you know like i said it depends and build your way up to to a good amount of band tension mm -hmm. yeah but like everything else, it has its place in training. You know, like it's good for three months, but then you might want to back down and change it up. Um, like same with like sled drags. Sled drags are great for like three months, but you can't do it year round because then it starts killing your your training. I feel like like you, mm -hmm. you can only do them for certain spots. Work on it and then train change it up to something different. When would you throw it in? When would you pull it out? Um, Just for yourself personally. Me you personally, yeah. um, I would do it about like three months on um and three months like three months off three months on three months off um especially uh, spe I, well, I'll take that especially around a meet time last six weeks i went and sled drag you mm -hmm. know because it, it was more trying to be as strong in, as i possibly could so mm -hmm. yeah that's when i would i would take it out and then add it right after meet, add it in um a lot of it and then just start over time you know lowering it a little bit and then like you know a month out mm -hmm. you know eventually getting done be done with it so you weren't you weren't replacing it with something else not towards me no yeah no sometimes i would change like you know like uh lou had battle ropes and stuff like that yeah. so sometimes i'd sled drag sometimes i'd battle you know it just yeah. depend you know like you just whatever you felt like doing that day but it would be some sort of conditioning yeah. i'll tell you what killed me um have you you might have done these have you ever done the uh sled drags where you you 
put your hands on it and oh, like yeah. you almost like oh, yeah. crawl. Who, buddy? No, that, that lights your hamstrings. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Yeah. He had all kinds of things where, you know, as <clears throat> the sled was kind of my go-to. Yeah. You know, because it's easy. Yeah. You know, it's just fucking easy. Yeah. And if you're if you're sore, yeah. you upper body, do front raises, side right. whatever. It's right. just, it, it was just simple and easy. Yeah. You know, some of the things I hated, you know, were like fucking wheelbarrow. You know, I hated that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I couldn't stand that. The the battle ropes, I could do without that. Yeah. You know, like whatever. You yeah. know, it's... <laughs> Right. You know, Louis would sit there and do that fucking thing for 45 minutes. Yeah. Like, how in the fuck? Yeah, he has work capacity was through the roof. Oh, yeah. You know, I still, to this day, you know, don't understand. He was in shape, that's for sure. Yeah, he was there, always in shape. Well, there was a mental component there. Oh, yeah, There's yeah. something. Well, he, he said he could take his mind to a different place. Obviously. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there was something. Yeah, Because yeah. I would watch him do some things like just the, you know, the bent over wheelbarrow. Yeah. You know, just the, the rolling shrug type yeah. thing, which will light you up and... yeah. 15 reps. If yeah. you do anything for 30 reps, it's going to burn. Yeah. Sit over there for five minutes. Right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Or, or standing abs. You do standing abs for mm -hmm. like 10 minutes straight. You know, yes. Just, uh, yeah. Yes. Now, the one the one thing he did that it fucked me up for a while until I figured it out was the, um, he was do these, the stability ball dumbbell presses, right? Mm -hmm. And he, he would always do these on the days we weren't there, right? <laughs> like Tuesday, Thursday, yeah. you know, the, the yeah. other days. And we, oh, I did 100 pounds for five minutes. I'm like, that's bullshit. He <laughs> did not fucking do 100 pounds for five minutes. Right. You know, so I'm, we're going back, and he keep telling me this. I'm like, the fuck, you're lying to me. Like, <laughs> this is physically not possible, <laughs> right? I mean, right. think of, like, how many yeah. reps is that? Like, 200 reps. Yeah, something crazy. Until one day I came in there, and I see what he's doing. I think this is important, because with the time stuff, this is a big variable. Yeah. You know, you're not pressing the whole time. Yeah. It can be holding it on your chest, which is just loaded stretching. Right. Right or holding it at the top. top Same thing with yeah. the bamboo bar. If you got hanging kettlebells for five minutes, yeah. you're not like people think you're. And that's what I was thinking. He's yeah. just like repping this shit out for yeah. five minutes. I'm like, there's no way. Right. Then I saw it and I'm like, oh, no, I get it. Yeah. You know, I, I could do that, but yeah. actually, I get it too. Yeah. Like, yeah. there's loaded stretching right. in there. That's got a big benefit. Right. You know, there's the the work capacity. There's a mental aspect too. Yeah. I mean, you got to do it five right. minutes. It sucks. Right. You know, it's like the the bamboo bar with the kettlebells mm -hmm. for i do it for a song you know as soon as the <laughs> song starts you just go right you know it sucks yeah. you know but yeah. you know it's it, that's the time to work right right is that how you guys did the time to work as well yeah. yeah what other exercises did you use um i know there's like banded good mornings and good yeah that uh belt squat you know we did a lot of stuff with either squatting or walking on it um we do time reverse hypers um uh, uh you know, battle rope was for time. Uh, sled drags we do for time sometimes. Um, we do time with reverse, uh, or with side lateral raises, um, dumbbell presses sometimes. You know, all, just about any exercise you can do, you you know, mm -hmm. you can do it for time. I've seen him do like, t you know, time under tension with uh, like, uh, not, not like two minutes, but like, you know, slow down, slow up with that. Oh, I did it too, deadlifts, uh, uh, squats, you know, shit mm -hmm. like, like 10 seconds down, five seconds up, shit like that, yeah. What were some of the things you thought benefited you the most? With the time With stuff? the time stuff. Uh, First off, let's, did, did you think it helped you at all? Yeah, because I think it teaches you to think where you're at at each point of your lift. So let's say you do it for, with a squat. You can think through the whole lift, like where you're at here and here yeah, yeah. and here, you know, as opposed to like, let's say you, you shoot out of the hole real quick, but you fall forward and you don't know what the fuck's going on. Yeah. You know, you're able to think through the whole movement. That's a good point. Yeah. Now, that's a very valuable point because there's one of the things that's hard in the sport that a lot of people don't grasp is you have when you're in that lift mm -hmm. and say it's that 800 deadlift right so yeah. you're back to that 800 deadlift it slows down at a certain point you're right most people in their brain probably even you at that time all you're thinking is pull <laughs> you know just yeah. finish this motherfucker however yeah. you can but the more experienced you get yeah. the more in tune you get yeah. especially in the squat even the bench, you realize, fuck, this ain't where it's supposed to be, you know, correct. Right. And then you know what to do. Right. Right. It could be on the bench, flare the elbows, you know, right. it's, you know, you, something's not where it's supposed to be. And the squat is you're going down, maybe it's fuck, 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 you feel like your head's going to explode. <laughs> right. And you can't go any lower, then you register, push knees out, boom, drop. Right. There it goes. Yep. But you got to be able to yep. Thank you ha think your way through it. Yeah. Right. And that's a learned 
attribute Ooh, yeah. where, you know, Chuck would always talk about learning that just with the max effort work and, you know, the bands and how that increases your, the, the time under tension. Yeah. So say if it takes four seconds for you to pull a deadlift, you know, then what are you going to do if it takes five? Right. You know, and at some point you got to be able to process what am I supposed to do? Right. I, isometrics kind of help with this too. Um, because you're in that position for a little bit, kinda, yeah. kinda, because yeah. you're only in one position. Yeah. But with what you're talking about, I never equated that, mm -hmm. you know, into this whole process. Right. Right. Because now you're doing that time stuff. No, it's not a one rep max, but you're still mentally processing. Right. Oh, yeah. Where are you? Yeah. Where are you supposed to be? Yeah. Because fuck over four minutes, you're going to break down. Yeah. It, 100%. It, it, right. And if you can do that and master that, then you know, you have confidence going in, you know, because you know where you're at on everything. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. And so, yeah, for no, sure. No, that's a huge thing, man, because yeah. that's hard to teach. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think experience is the only way to do it. You know what I'm <laughs> right. saying? It's because right. at a certain point you're going to have that one lift and it's slow and yeah. you, and something's clicks and you just think, Oh shit, do yeah. this. Yeah. Then you get up and you're like, yeah. you, it's almost like, did you see that? Yeah. You know, you want people to like, did right. you see I fucked this up, but I fixed it. <laughs> it and, and doing that training too, if you do it properly, it's going to wear you out. Like it's, yeah. you know, because you're, you're putting your mind into it also. And you know, it, it's going to wear you out just like a max lift. Cause you're, you know, really, focusing on everything yes and the conditioning aspect mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of things with that right. um i cut you off what are some of the other things so is a belt squat sled squat the main lifts yeah you know the squats stuff yeah. like that the main lifts when you did the main lifts would you do it with a bamboo bar to make it lighter harder or would you do it with a straight bar uh, sometimes we would do it with a straight bar with hanging kettlebells. Okay. So like throw you out of place. And yeah. We do it that way. Um, with deadlift, we would. Um, now with the squat, was it on the box or not? Uh, no, no. Most times no box. Okay. Yeah. We would just take it down. Um, and then a lot of times in a deadlift, we would do it like out of a pin. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we would um, put the pin at the bottom and then pull, put a pin at top and like pull, you know, mm -hmm. pull against mm -hmm. that or, you know, pull the pin and just, you know, five, four, three, you know, slow, slow. And that, I mean, for the deadlift, that builds your grip too, because you're hanging on to, you know, say 300 pounds, but you're hanging on for, you know, 30 seconds, a minute, you know, whatever it is. What do you mean five, four, three? So you're so, starting. So they're, yeah, they're counting, like, like they're going to count five seconds down, five seconds up. Somebody's going to count, you know, I five, yeah. four, three. And then at every second, you're at a different. So you're starting uh, at the top. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And right. then, and then sometimes you'll 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 you know you'll pull it fast and then go slow down, or sometimes you go slow up, slow down. It just depends, really, like what you need to work on, you know, mm -hmm. and, and where your body's at. Mm -hmm. you know, so. so with a deadlift, what type of weight are you talking about? Obviously, it's not going to be super heavy, but it's not going to be. So for me, for example, I was an 800 pound puller. I was using 405. So 50 percent. Yeah. 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 So about nine seconds on the way down, like five at the one spot, four. Uh, no, no, it'd be uh, usually like five seconds for the whole thing or 10 seconds gotcha. for the whole thing. Yeah, and then tip five or 10 All right, I get it, I get it. Yeah. So you're just slower and slow. Yeah, yeah. So you're not pausing. You, no, 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 okay. pausing. But Got you it. know where you're at, Yeah. you know, every second that they count. And that go, I think that helps you because, you know, not all deadlifts are going to be, like you said, not going to be fast, you know? Yes. So it just, it helps you be like, okay, I'm right here. This is where I need to be, you know? Like, mm -hmm. you, like you said, yeah, mm -hmm. 100%. You know. What are... <clears throat> With the, the meets that you go to, what are some of the mistakes that you see that people are making in the meet outside of the technical thing? Just because you've done a lot of meets, right? Yeah. Um, it seems like everybody has a coach nowadays. Yeah. And like I call them cell phone coaches because it seems like their coaches are always like here yes. and they don't know how to correct the shit. So first of all, I, I feel like, and they're probably cheap coaches. So mm -hmm. I feel like if you want to do something in a sport and you want to hire a coach, you need to hire like someone who knows what they're doing mm -hmm. for one, one that's not going to be on their cell phone, one that cares about what they're doing. You know, mm -hmm. that's one thing I've seen that drives me nuts. Another, um, a lot of, some of them just seem like they're out of shape, you know, like you can just kind of tell, like there's no, can like by the time the deadlifts are, they're, you know, super gassed and, mm -hmm. like, um, and then, like you know, the the uh, the weaknesses and like the mid back, I was saying, like uh, hamstrings seem to be weak, low back, uh, you know, all the power lifting muscles seem to be kind of weak. You know, mm -hmm. they don't seem super locked in like they should be. Mm -hmm. you know, so, 
That's about the three that I can think of. How can how can somebody get a hold of you? Um, What's the best way to find you? Best way is probably Instagram. Uh, my handle is Luke Edwards five times underscore pro. Um, direct message or uh, uh, Lucas Edwards on uh, Facebook. You know, send me a message or something like that. It's yeah, that's usually the best way to get a hold of me. And I assume that you're you're taking clients now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be taking any more in person. I might have like one more spot, but yeah, I, I got about three more people I'm going to take online, and then I'm going to be. That's all I need. Okay. Yeah. Um, man, it's been a pleasure having you out. Yeah, thanks. This has been a me. great time. Well, I got to tell I got to tell a story about yeah. you real quick. Oh shit! So Here people we go. people might not know this, and and they people need to know how good of a dude Dave Tate is. So after my first transplant. Um, I moved into a house and Dave probably, he probably never told anybody this, but he gave me the exact money for two guys in a truck. Cause I couldn't lift anything heavy to move all my big stuff, uh, over to my house. And that's something that I'll never forget. And I, I that means a lot to me, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you for coming out. Yeah. You know, it's, Anytime, been, it's been great, man. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you guys for listening. I know you have options of other podcasts you can listen to. I appreciate your time. Come in to support the Table Talk podcast. Check the links in the description below, and we'll see you next time.